All right, shalom, shalom, family. As always, today is one of those days where we're going to go over a deep topic, Synthetic Sunday. Today is that Sunday, right? So fair use today, information used today is obviously going to be used for education purposes and obviously for teaching and history. So with that said, I usually start this little video for the Synthetic Sundays, but today I'm going to let this 10-minute video play and talk about it. So obviously we're going to play something very important today and it's going to be about this topic. And the steps. Okay, cool. You've got my attention. Turkic nomads that converted to Judaism? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Our story begins in the Pontic Steppes of the early 600s. The supermassive and legendary empire, the Gok Turk Cognate, has split into two after a long civil war, leaving the western half to collapse under the pressure of the Sui Dynasty and later the conquest of the Tang Dynasty. This leaves nothing but a power vacuum for the people of these harsh Steppelins. Here, two mighty confederations of tribes fight for supremacy. The Bulgars, now united under Kubrat Khan and the old Great Bulgaria, are under constant pressure from the fierce tribes of the Khazars. Following Kubrat's death, the Khazars take control of the Pontic Steppe, subjugating the Bulgar peoples and adopting their language as a lingua franca. Kubrat's son Aspura would flee to the south where he would found the first Bulgarian Empire in the Balkans while his brother would travel north to the Volga River establishing the Volga Bulgars. From this the Khazars would form into a cognate which is a union of lesser khanates. But a new and even more powerful threat would arise in the following decade. The first ever Islamic Caliphate, the Rashidun Caliphate, was attempting to expand into the Caucasus in 652, a large Islamic army under Abid ar Rahmat ibn Rabia advanced towards the Khazar capital, Balanzar. A huge battle took place. Both brave armies, motivated by intense fervor, catapults and cavalry were utilized by both sides. But the Khazars, under Korpin Takhan, inflicted heavy losses onto the Arabs, leaving them to flee in absolute defeat. Soon after, well, soon being like a few years, but, you know, relatively soon, the caliphate would suffer a civil war. You might have heard of it, you know, the one that made them become the Umayyad Caliphate. Yeah, that one. Prevented any more Muslim raids for the Arab being. The city, though, had proven itself to be strategically inferior, and the capital was moved to Samander, and then later, Attil. Now I'm going to take the time to go into the government structure of the cognate. Now, the civil and everyday affairs, as well as military campaigns, were controlled by the Kagan Bek, who was parallel to the shogun of Tokugawa, Japan. To assist the Bek, beneath him were subordinate officers known as Tarkins. Khazar armies were expected to never retreat and fight until the death. Otherwise, returning soldiers would be executed. The cognate, however, in a greater sense, was ruled by an absolute ruler, the Kagan, whom the Beck paid homage to. Upon being selected to be Kagan, the nobles would strangle him until he shouted out how many years he wanted to rule. After that period passed, he would be executed. Now what is an emperor without his royal gods? The Kagan was guarded peculiarly by Muslim mercenaries from the region of Khwarezm. I mean, come on, how is that not cool? As the Khazars progressed through the 700s and 800s, they developed a very strong economy, taxing all transit coming from east and west that had to travel through Khazaria. This was, of course, the backbone of the Khazar economy, and their trade routes were heavily enforced. The year 700 marks the beginning of a 200-year period known as Pax Khazarica. The Khazars would found Kiev on the Dnieper River, using it as a trading outpost. However, this period would be interrupted as the Umayyad Caliphate under Caliph Yazid II expanded into Armenia and the southern Caucasus, threatening the Khazars leading to the Second Arab-Khazar War. The cognate in response 
sent a terrifyingly sized army of 30,000 troops and invaded Durban, crushing the local armies and raiding throughout the neighboring Islamic Emirates. In the year 724, Arab general Al-Jahar ibn Abdallah al-Hakim, in a long, drawn-out battle, which saw intense bloodshed on both sides, managed to inflict a defeat on the Khazars, conquering Caucasian Iberia and founding the Emirate of Tbilisi. The Bek Barjik seeked vengeance for this devastating defeat. He conquered Azerbaijan city by city and took the head of a killed Arab general as a decoration for his throne. But this victory was short-lived, as in the year 737, Muslim general Marwan ibn Muhammad invaded deep into Khazaria, forcing the Khagan to surrender and pledge his nation under Sharia law and the allegiance of the Umayyad Caliphate. All had seemed lost for this mighty empire, but then a miracle occurred that would return Pax Khazaria to the Caucasus and the Pontic Steppe. The Abbasid Revolution began in 744, leading to an inability for the Arabs to govern the steppes, leaving the Khagan to return to his full power. It is in this period that the Khazars did what they are known for. Well, I mean, if anybody knows them at all, that is. Yeah, that's right. Their conversion to Judaism. As a letter from the last Khagan to a rabbi in Cordoba will lead us to believe, it, it's called the, the Khazar Correspondence. It's one of the main historic documents we have to get information about the Khazars from. And what basically what the Khagan states is that the conversion of Judaism took place in around the late 700s under the rule of Bulan Khagan. Bulan is described as a, being a pretty cool guy. And uh, he had several visitations from angels, leading him to seek the one true faith. Bulan would go on to expel the wizards and idol worshippers and the sorcerers. Whatever wizards and sorcerers are. I mean, this is the English translation of what he said. I assume it was translated by Oxford University. I don't know what a wizard is, but, you know, whatever. Take that as you will. But anyway, so this gained the attention of the, the Byzantine Empire, or Eastern Roman Empire, and then the Abbasid Caliphate. And both of these empires were seeking to end Khazar raids on the border. To end it, they wanted to to make the Khazars allies through conversion, both empires sent religious missionaries, and Bulan agreed to hold a religious debate where he asked the Muslim Qadi and the Christian priests to argue with one another until they proved which religion is superior to him. After seeing neither arrive to any conclusion, after excessive dispute, he asked the priests of the religion of the Israelites and the Muslims, which is preferred. Of course, not wanting to agree with the Muslim Qadi, the priest told Bulan that the Israelites were superior religion. Bulan then asked the Qadi of the religion of the Christians and the Israelites, which is preferred. The Qadi, of course, not wanting to agree with the Christian priest, told Bulan that the Jews were preferred. Upon hearing these two responses, Bulan Kagan adopted Judaism as the religion of his state, circumcising himself and all of his nobles. Of course, likely, outside of the nobility, Khazaria would continue to be a very religiously diverse nation, with Jews, Christians, Muslims, and pagans living together. It's worth noting that Judaism contains a mythical origin for the various Turkic tribes, and the Khazars took this tradition very dear. The mythical brother of Ashkenazi in the Torah, Tagamara, was said to be the father of all Turkic people, or if you will, the Ataturk before Mustafa Kemal. Hmm? He had several mythical sons who began each Turkic tribe. Kozar for the Khazars, Bulgar for the Bulgars, Avar for the Avars, Yujur for the Yugurs, Alan for the Alans, etc. You know, not very crazy, but uh, kind of neat, I guess. The demise of the Khazars was a slow and painful one, as their decline would come after a series of unfortunate events. The Slavs had been developing power towards the west of Khazaria, causing the cognate to eventually lose control of Kiev by the 860s to Olag of Novgorod, founding the Kievan Rus state. At the same time, Pax Khazaria was threatened by the growing power of the Pechenig Khanates south of the Rus. Their relations with the Byzantines had previously deteriorated, most likely leading to them encouraging the neighbors of the Khazars to engage in raids and other undermining activities. The Byzantines and the Khazars likely fought in Crimea and were looking for a way to isolate the Khazars and destroy them. Though the death of the Cognate would come from a mighty conqueror who would be the bane of existence for so many Eastern European states. The Great Destroyer, Svidoslav I of Kiev, a staunch pagan, who in his short life would be a man of great chaos and success. 
Spidoslav began his campaign in the Pontic Steppe by rallying the support of Khazari's neighboring Slavic tribes and would force any who didn't comply with him to submit by force. He would invade the Volga Bulgars, a Khazarian vassal state. A vassal state is a, a state that's dependent upon or under the control of another state. Spidoslav showed his resourcefulness by employing Ogots and Pechenig tribesmen as mercenaries to counter the well-equipped and more elite Khazarian and Bulgarian cavalry. After his campaign of the Volga, this unstoppable man would overwhelm the Khazars in a devastating circular sweep, first occupying Sarkel, converting it into a Slavic settlement, then subsequently sacking Khazarian Crimea. The destruction of the cognate would come as Spidoslav destroyed the royal city of Attil, leaving but a remnant state if possibly even that. A visitor to Attil after this hellish destruction of an empire would describe the scene as not having a grape or raisin remain, nor a single leaf on a branch. The Khazarian people, not of a single ethnicity, would be absorbed by successive hordes and empires. This bad boy would move on to the south and end the reign of our friends from earlier, the First Bulgarian Empire, destabilizing them, leading to their collapse in the future by Byzantium. I just don't get what the Khazars aren't talking talked about in every single world history class on the planet. Like, come on, they're the only Jewish empire in history. They were Turkic nomads in the steppes that converted to Judaism. All right, like, shalom, shalom, family. Before we even life. start, we're going to say the Lord's prayers before we even start. So as always, as always, say the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, honored be thy name. May thy kingdom come, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as forgive those who trespass against us and lead us on a righteous path and guard us from the evil one. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Shalom. Shalom. So I just updated the description. There's going to be a couple things in the description. So first thing I want to talk about is the genetic connection with these things. And we're going to talk about a video. So obviously we have a couple things to go over, but obviously I'm going to translate it and make it um, understandable, even if someone's not studying the genetic things and whatnot. But let me grab a link here from this thing. So this is what we're going to be going over today. So this scientist, right, this geneticist, this um, bioinformant, he actually gives a lot of information in this little video, but it is very complex. Now, when I say very complex, it's kind of complex on what he finds, but what he finds is so solid that this may be one of our last synthetic Sundays. So we're going to look at this and we're going to go over this and talk about the information here. Um, if we do do some more, we'll probably do it on some um, other little things. But obviously, touching on this um, topic, I think we touched on it enough. So we're going to touch on it one more time with a very great illustration that is done by this geneticist. First, let's get an idea on what is the common idea that people think is going on in the world today. What do people think about the Ashkenaz? Do they think that they're the Jews? Most people do. It seems that most people do. Um, this is some of the ideas of the routes they think, right? They think they came from the land of the Levant um, right after Jerusalem fell, and then they came up, which we know isn't true because the book of Acts tell us that they couldn't go into Rome. We know that is not something that was feasible. But there was some people that came into Rome, but not as much as um, the illustration of millions and millions because there was actually millions and millions of Jews in this area. That's very important to understand. Um, now, what's also important is that this picture, you see what's going on right here. One of the most interesting things about this picture is that they always try to relate them as also coming from Spain. Now, the picture here, we're going to look at something here. First, we need to understand, are they from Spain? No, right? 1492 is when the Jews were ex um, had to leave Spain. We already talked about the reports. Remember, we had talked directly um, about the, the reports itself. Right. For example, let's look at a piece of information um, on there. Let me go down and let's look at something. Now, if you already know, we have a few videos where we talked about the reports and everything. And where did the Jew, where did the Jews go after they had to leave? Right. In 1492 and all the decrees that were made, what where did they have to go? Africa. That's long story short. That was two places they they was only able to go to, right? Um, how you say that to to grain or to Tangri, how you say that, and Azila, 
these two places, if you look them up, these are going to actually be in Africa. Those are the only places they were able to go. Whoever paid the tax got to go back in. But what happened to those that went back in? Became new Christians. They end up going to certain places, right? So we're going to look at that. So just for the sake of understanding, we have obviously the Synthetic Sunday where we go over a lot of these just to make this um, as clear as possible. Once you exclude the migration from Spain, which was in 1492, which a lot of these migrations, if you look, is actually earlier than 1492. Once you exclude the 1492 expulsion and understand that the connection of the Ashkenazi are not connected to Spain, as in, when I say connected to Spain, as in being the Sephardic Jews, who are the Spanish Jews, who are actually described as being dark skinned in, in the same sense as being related to the Negroes. Once you cut that off, let me show you what you actually are left with. You're actually left with a very uniform and understanding picture on why they are where they are. Um, and that migration has to do with what people were calling them before they knew who they were, which was a barbaric um, invasion, right? You may have heard of it, right? The barbarian invasion, right? The migration period, also known as the barbarian invasion, right? If you look at that map, you can actually see a clear understanding, right? A lot of the people came into the areas. And then what did they do? As you can see right here, their illustration, they came into these areas, right? And if you look at the barbarian migration, we can see that. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at also the genetics and the linguistics and see how all that is matching with the geographics, obviously pulling up ancient genetics and looking at these things more closer. So we're going to be looking at that in their migration. But the first thing we're going to do, close this, and this one, um, which, you know, I put this here also so you can see. And if you go and click this, you can read a little bit about it, what the person puts there. Um, down here, he just talks a little bit about them and everything. And he talks about how basically the major source of basically European ancestry and Ashkenazi Jews was found to be Southeastern Europe. 60 to 80 percent right what is the what is the other percentage what is the why is it why is it always say 60 to 80 percent why not a hundred percent because there's a percentage in them that you have to know right when you see things like for example um you have you probably seen the thing that came out that said um the ashkenazis are such and such canaanites and whatnot um we did a little video on that and talked about that little thing as that was very important and interesting um the reason why is because let me see if I had that quote right here. It said Ashkenazi Jews were roughly 70 to 60 percent, right? Why do you always see that? 70 to 60, 80 percent, stuff around there. Why do you see percentages like that? Because there is a lineage in them that's actually Shemitic. There is a lineage in them that's actually Shemitic. And that Shemitic lineage is actually E1B1B. That's actually the Shemitic lineage. Now, I'm going to actually do a video on, again, of the Arab line and a couple of things that had happened during the um, uh, what you call the Bronze Age collapse. And that's going to be something that we're going to you know touch on and get a little understanding on that. So that E1B1B, excluding that, they're 100 percent European. Right. If you exclude the E1B1B, which is commonly seen in these upper areas, because these are the real Arabs that came over here during the Bronze Age collapse and stuff like that. You see E1B1B there, not E1B1A, not A, not B. Right. Not even E1 or E2, but E1B1B you commonly see because that's actually the Arab line. And that's that's something for another day to touch on. But what we're going to do, we're going to actually look at this thing and we're going to understand it today. So large portion E1B1B as seen in different populations. Just keep that in mind that that's why you sometimes see percentages are lower. Right. When it comes to the Ashkenaz, it's because that E1B1B lineage. But let's keep on and keep it on, right? So you can see right here, just to understand, right, 60 to 70 percent of the European ancestry, right? We already seen that, and they talk about how it goes back 30 generations. They, sometimes it goes up to 50 generations, right? They can see the European lineages weren't something that was mixed in, but rather that's what they were. That's just what they were. So we're going to look at this thing because I thought it was interesting with the bottleneck and everything, but this video that I'm going to show you today, we're going to break it down and it's going to be absolutely um, amazing. So let's let it play and let's break it down. So different parts. If you have any questions, I'm going to answer some things that also on certain parts I'm going to talk about. I would like to present our work uh, understanding the origins of uh, 
ancient Ashkenaz and the Yiddish language. Uh, this work uh, was done in collaboration with Paul Wexler and other colleagues. The purpose of this work uh, was to understand the uh, geographical origins of, uh, of the Yiddish language. It's one of the last European languages whose linguistic and geographical classification remain unclear even after 300 years of research. Um, all right, so real fast, what he's about to study is the study of the Yiddish. Now, before we even start, what is Yiddish, right? What is the what is even Yiddish? Um, it's actually a branch of the Indo-European family. Remember, we was talking about the movement of these, as they call the barbarians and everything. Very important to keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to go down before we look at that up there. So who I'm showing you today, just to show you a little bit, he worked with Natural Geographic. His paper was printed. He worked with a lot of different geneticists and obviously experts. There's his name right there, right? Aaron Elhak, how you say that? That's actually him who we're actually going to show today, that he is actually a professional that's going to go over these things. But he's also, as many of us, are actually facing persecution on truth. He's actually He actually found some truth. And it's actually better when people uh, pick the truth and realize the truth than um, um, meet, you know, a bad end because they couldn't accept the truth. Just understand what we're going to show today is a duck is a duck, right? Slav is a slav. The sense of understanding uh, what he's going to show you today is without a doubt uh, sound. Everything he's showing you is sound. But let me show you something real fast. Let me click this. Um, Indo-European is a word that the people chose to select during a time when they were starting to find out a lot of this stuff was related, right? Indo-European, you probably know about that, right? Another time it was going to be called Japhatic Lines. I'm sorry that this is so um, blurry. You can see also a language of the Scythians. Now, let me go down and show you something. What we're looking at is the origin of the Yiddish language, right? If you would look from the Germanic language, right, in the linguistics, Germanic actually brings forth the Yiddish language. Now, we're going to look at the full picture of it, though. We're going to look at the full picture, and that's what he's going to bring out. But it's connected, right? The Yiddish language is connected to some people, and we're going to look at the genetics, too, to see how is that um, connected, right? The Kimberin, and we're going to have Germans, obviously. We're going to have Dutch. Uh, but mainly, we're going to focus on certain groups, um, such as, I'm going to show you. Let's make sure we look in here at the Slav. So we got some Slavs here. What we're going to look at is this Slavic language right here. You see the Slavic language right here, right? We're going to look at this today because this Slavic language is actually very important to note because it brings forth what we're going to look at today. So the Russians, right? The Russians. And we also got the Polish too. So we got the Polish, but mainly we're going to look at what he's going to go in the pace of how he's going to go. So let's let it play. And then we're going to break down it as we go. Yiddish is the native language of Ashkenazi Jews, um, whose own origin remain uh, debatable, um, which uh, gave us hope that if we can localize uh, that language, we can also localize the origin of Ashkenazi Jews. Um, assuming that uh, the history of these two is parallel, as Weinrich noted, at least in part, um, that uh, would be able to, uh, um, th th this would work. Um, another question we were hoping to answer is where is Ashkenaz? Ashkenaz, um, as you know, is one of the most disputed uh, biblical um, place names. It is mentioned um, few, only a few times, twice uh, in the context of Noah's uh, descendants and once in reference to uh, some legendary kingdom that would wage war on Babylon um, at the end of the days. Um, this is the first study that analyzed the genetic data of Yiddish speakers. So, of course, Ashkenazic Jews, but specifically Yiddish speakers. Um, and it is carried out at a time where there are fewer and fewer people who speak uh, solely Yiddish um, willing to uh, participate in such study. Um, our uh, rationale was. So I know for some reason this one is fairly quiet. I can actually, I can probably find um, one that's l more loud, but the reason why we went to this one, because this one's right off the site, I don't know why he made his so quiet, but if it's quiet, I apologize. Um, you might have to put headphones on, um, but we will be breaking it down piece by piece. So I apologize that it's so quiet. 
that uh, there is a very well-established relationships between genetics, geography, and language. Um, genetics uh, are, can be translated to geographical regions using a tool that we developed called Geographic Population Structure, or GPS. Um, and again, the relationships between language and geography have been studied uh, very, very well. Um, altogether, if we considered all these three, um, we should be able to answer the question who are um, Ashkenazi Jews, where, where are they from, and where uh, Yiddish has uh, originated. Um, of course, there is a lot of interest in answering those questions. And as you can see in this figure that I grabbed from the internet, I, I don't know how reliable it is. It simply uh, shows there is a lot of interest in mapping um, uh, place names from the Bible to an actual locations. And if you look close enough, you can see that only Ashkenazi is mentioned twice uh, because there's never been any certainty as to as to where it is. Okay. This is based on the um, uh, 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 names mentioned in, uh, in Genesis 10. Um, we uh, followed uh, two hypotheses in this work, comparing two possible scenarios. The first, the left one in blue, is called the Rhineland hypothesis. This hypothesis um, presumes that at some point the Judeans were exiled to Rome in the year of 70. This, of course, event that uh, has never happened. All right, so you now this part is very important. This way that he's showing right here. Now, we already had talked about this before, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it a little more. Let's go down a little bit and talk about it. So he had brought this out a while back, and he had brought this to the people, and they had discredited him. But the thing about his findings, when taken piece by piece and looked at um, directly, it's right. His, his findings are 100% right, and is, is nobody who can discredit it. In fact, they didn't even discredit it because the reason why they didn't discredit it is because the whole picture of what he actually um, describes here is actually solidified in maps. It's actually everything that he's showing is actually solidified in maps. Uh, I'm going to just... I was going to click this thing, but I don't know why it's not loading. It took a little bit. But as you can see, what he's going to talk about is two different routes. The reason why is important is because this route is clearly false. Why? It's because we don't have any records of it. Um, also, it we actually have records against it. Um, for example, the Romans during the exile, for example, the Romans didn't exile them, all the Jews, to Rome. Why? How do we know that that's true? Because one, we actually have them recorded in 132 AD coming back to Jerusalem. And then right after that, we have them recorded going to Arabia. Um, Truth on Edited, he had did a very great video on the migration of Israel into Arabia and the recording of a war that happened in six, about 600 AD. That's very important. So the, the, the Judeans, at least to 600 AD, at least, did not go anywhere else besides South. They didn't go anywhere else but South. That's a fact in uh, history. That's something, that's what, that's what he's talking about here, that this, them in 70 AD, they didn't go into Rome on a Roman exile. There were some Judeans that went into Rome, for example, Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus went into Rome, but he was an exception. He was an exception. The reason why he was an exception, because he made a prophecy about what was gonna happen. At first they was gonna kill him. They was gonna crucify him right then and there. But they end up, he ended up making a prophecy, then Spazin put him in prison, let him wait to see if it came to pass. It came to pass. They released him, gave him a new name and everything. But that's an exception. That's, that wasn't a common thing for someone just to go to Rome because they had a law to, ex, to expel all the Judeans from the land. And that's actually recorded in the book of Acts. But also what we're seeing on this side, we're going to see what he talks about here um, because both of these are actually fairly interesting. So I'm going to let you uh, hear this one as well on how he explained it. Uh, it's actually really interesting. Reflects in his book the invention of the Jewish uh, people. Um, but um, let's moving on from this. Um, after their arrival in Rome, at some points they uh, presumably uh, were released from captivity, uh, migrated into uh, uh, Franconia, um, and then to the Rhineland, where they adopted some German dialects and. It turned out into 
uh, Yiddish. And uh, in the mid 13th century, uh, mass migration to Eastern Europe. Um, and, um, and at that point, they experienced the demographic miracle uh, that um, created a very large uh, Jewish community. Uh, needless to say, uh, this miracle event, um, I don't need to mention that it is disputed. It is sufficient to say that um, it should not be considered science. Um, however, you'd be surprised how many people um, write that in their papers as if this is a, a reasonable and viable explanation. All right, my bad. So real fast, it's actually really important what he's talking about here. I've been talking about this a while. It's called the bottleneck. We had, actually on our video, we had on um, not on Synthetic Sunday, but we had talked about it early on. Um, one of our earliest videos, we talked about the genetic bottleneck. There was a, the so-called genetic bottleneck that um, at one point in time, that was only about like 350 people. Then all of a sudden it became millions. But the truth of the matter is actually not that they kept on having more and more children but that they were the same people. For example, let me go up a little bit. Let me show you right here. The reason why they kept increasing, why the Jews kept increasing, because the Jews genetically, let me just show you something before we look at that. Let's go over here and look at the Jews, uh, the Ashkenazi uh, Y chromosome. Now, they don't have one. That's what makes it, that's, that's the reason why I find this very important to talk about, because they don't have one, and he's going to talk about that, how they don't have one um, father line. The reason why is because we know that this is actually the real Arab, and it can be followed throughout different history, and this is actually going to be connected to the Turks. This is also going to be connected to the Scythians. These two are connected to the Scythians, but there's one certain one that's connected to the Khazars, which is this one. This is connected to the Khazars. So you're going to have R2 and R1, and then you're going to have these other ones as well. And these are also going to be connected to a lot of, of the European lineages. So there's actually a few. There's actually a few Y chromosomes in them. And that's why this is actually a very interesting study. In fact, um, his paper was actually one of the most read papers out of the whole world. At the time when he released it, it was one of the most, almost all his papers that he wrote, like he wrote, wrote like four or five papers. A lot of his papers were at the top rank of the readings because a lot of stuff that he was finding was credible. Everything that he was finding was actually absolutely credible. So now note these haplogroups. The reason why I want to I want you to note these haplogroups because we're going to see them again. Especially R, you see the R, and then we're going to see a lot of these, the E's. Let's take a look here. So what I'm showing you here, this is actually a very interesting one. Um, this is actually going to be genetics of ancient Slavic areas, right? And you can see these are going to have obviously sources to them and everything. You can see the sources. You can click them and see them. But this is going to be the Y chromosomes of the areas of where the Slavs were, right? You got a little idea of that, where the Slavs were and everything. And this is going to be ancient. What I'm actually showing you is going to be really ancient. These are going to be ancient things that I'm going to show you here. So first things first, let's go back over here. Let's go down a little bit. Let's go. So obviously, here's the lands, the areas, right? They're obviously going to be connected with different languages, right? Samaritans and... Sumerians, and then you have your, uh, obviously your dramatics and everything. Um, but let's look at this. Now I wanna show you what, what do we find there? What's some of the genetics that we find there? Um, speaking of some of the ancient genetics, we're gonna see J's there, we're gonna see R's there, E1B1B, right? And a large portion too, a large portion of E1B1B, almost actually larger um, than the rest of these. And a lot of these um, areas are gonna be certain areas to look at. And this certain area right here, let me show you something. Because I think this this area right here, the uh, Sabia, let me show you something real fast if I'm probably pronouncing that uh, weird, Sabia. I'm going to show you something. Let me go to 1756. Play something on here. Culture type. Then after that. So right here. 
have sex with anyone. The nice political boundaries of the modern world we are used to today didn't exist for most of history. A lot of tribes lived amongst each other and with each other. Trying to define an exact area where the Germanic, Sarmatian, Celtic, Slavic tribes lived is impossible. People moved, people lived with one another, people procreated with one another, etc. Of course, there were areas where only one tribe was, but there were many overlapping areas. So with that in mind, the reason why most of Slavic evidence seems to point towards Polesia is because that was the largest and most homogeneous homogeneous area where the Slavs lived. However, at the same time, the certain Slavic characteristics found in the Chenyakov culture type show a presence of some Slavic tribes, even though the culture type has more Germanic and Sarmantian traits. It's the same goes All right, so the reason why I wanted to show you that is because he's going to talk about that, that what they're actually going to go over is that the Slavs, the way to find the Slavs is almost impossible. If you, if you, when I say almost impossible to pinpoint locate one, it's, it's like saying finding one Hablo group that is going to be your Ashkenazi Hablo group because how much Hablo groups do they have? Many. Um, for example, I and J are connected. So notice you have see I's and you see J's. I's and J's are connected. You see Q's and R's, but here it's just the R's, right? We already talked about that. If you've seen the one Omegog, right? R1 and RB. R R1 is all the way on the east side, right? I don't know why I don't have a map. I'll usually always have a map open. Right. R1 was found far east. That's like China, right? Eastwards towards China. And then R1B is found towards Britain and um, all those areas like Spain and stuff like that. That's going to be your R1B, right? That's westward, right? And those are going to be actually connected to the Scythian lineage. That's going to be connected to the Scythian lineage. Um, so it's very, very important. So over here, R1B was mainly found over here. And then over here is R1A. So you're gonna find a lot of R1A over here, more on this area over here. Now, this area right here is kind of like the midpoint, especially over here. These, these areas right here was like the midpoints of it all. And this is where we find the Slavic um, origins, right? We're gonna look at that because the Slavic origin is connected to the Yiddish origin. And, but you're gonna see some, as we had talked about before, Arab lineages, right? So you can see that E1, B1, B, the Arab, these are actually the original Arabic lineages. These Arabic lineages are actually going to bring us some of the Hebrew languages that end up getting mixed in with the Slavic language. And you can see obviously having a large portion, but obviously more European lineages, though in small, smaller portions, but larger um, in one portion of E1B1B. But counting all these together, there's more European um, than there is of the E1B1B Arabic language, Arabic uh, lineage. So this is going to be the area of the Slavs. The reason why that's important is because there is going to be a connection uh, with the Slavs and the Germanic tribes, right? Remember we talked about America, right? What was called America when we seen that and the connection to these things. Go down a little bit to that part. Let me see and make sure this is the one I want. Yes. I'm going to go down to that, right? We talked about that. Remember we talked about that and we talk about uh, Magog. Talk about America and how that's connected there, right? Arm or armo, or how you say that? America, how you say that? Basically, it's gonna be a language. It's a language, but it's also a place, right? We remember we talked about it. How it's a Celtic dialect, also called Britain, which Britain was a language at the time. But America is also a place, so it's a language and a place. Um, also, that's where America came from. Very interesting because the genetics are all aligned. So we're going to see this. We're going to, the reason why we're going to, I'm showing you this is because we're going to see a lot of the language comparisons and everything. But notice that what you're actually seeing here, I'm going to show you something. What this is right here, um, I'm going to open this up real fast so you can see this right here. What I'm about to show you is pretty much Psalms 83. That's what I'm pretty much showing you is Psalms 83. And this is entirety, pretty much. Um, so pretty much why chromosome evidence of culture, diffusion of agriculture in, so and watch what it says here, Southeast Europe. So Southeast Europe, we're looking at ancient genetics, right? This actually was a big debate that they had going on. For example, the debate concerning, um, talk about the mechanisms, um, all those one night, talk about the farmers in Southeast Europe and whatnot. It just talks about what they did. It just talks about right here, it says, we analyze patterns of Y chromosome um, density in 160 subjects, right? Um, from 17 populations, right? This is actually gonna be a major study. The reason why we wanna look at this is because this is actually taking ancient genetics, right? Neolithic, right? Mesolithic, right? These are gonna be very old, 
right? It makes it possible to distinguish between these different ones and whatnot. Let's go down a little bit and look at what they found there. Let's see what they found. Um, and I think it's very important to see what they found. Let me actually click this and look at that. So this is the Hablo groups that they found. They found E1A, they found E1B1B. So sometimes I guess for these ones, they find that rare E1B1, that E1A there, which is really interesting. Um, maybe one day we'll go do a live on E1A and talk about that E1A and E1A, E2. That's something I'm working on um, uh, side by side. Um, it does have some connection to the Levant. Very interesting to see. Uh, but not in the areas where E1B1A was, but in some different areas. But E1B1B is going to be your larger portion. That's that's going to be your, uh, what they say, the Natufian, right? E1B1B is going to be a more of that larger portion. But these are actually your Shemitic lines. These are actually Shemitic lines that reach all the way to Europe, which we're going to look at today. Um, in fact, we're going to look at why did they mingle and how early did they mingle? In fact, let me actually open up something here and show you something. Let me go to this that was a while back while i was trying to show um the place where they were mixing and mingling um and i couldn't find it at first but then i i found it i didn't expect it to find it in the bronze age but i found it close to the bronze age and the um later area i'm gonna go all the way to the bronze age though it starts in the copper age the reason why i want to show you this at least I believe it starts in Copper Age. I'm going to open this and show you something. The reason why I want to show you this is because this is actually ancient genetics. Ancient genetics, if you don't know a lot about genetics, that's okay. But I'm going to explain it today as we go over them. Ancient genetics actually shows us um, what's been going on in the world, right? What's actually going on in the world. What's actually really, really going on. Um, but this one is really interesting because it has a lot of mixes. You can see these groups all the way up here, right? We already talked about that R1B, right? In these areas, R1B is the Scythian lineage. Now we're seeing over here, we got some Qs and everything that R lineage, obviously R1B in these areas. We already talked about those being Scythians. Let's go back because it's not this early, it's a little later. I'm gonna go over here. So Bronze Age, right? Think of, you know, the, the Sea Peoples or in the sense when Israel was moving around, right? This is late Copper Age. I'm seeing if it if it's this early, but it's in the Bronze Age. Just taking a look here because I want to show you exactly where they are. The reason why is because when you think of the Turks and the Seljuks and things like that, the Seljuk Turks and everything, they were actually a people that came from the East. Right. But they're not like it's not like it's a different people. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's not like we have like a uh, different people than Ham, Shem and Japheth, but we're going to have the same people. So you can see. Over here, there's a point, there's a there's a point of the area that I want you to look at and I'm going to show you. Once we find the E lineage there, you see right here, you see this lineage, you see the T, the J and the T right there. And then you see the now remember at this point of time, where was Israel in the Levant? So why why we have groups over here, um, different lineages. So what do we have right here? Let's take a look. Let's see if this make if it if it makes it blurry or if it makes it large. That thing's not opening. I'm gonna just zoom in. Let's look at this part right here. So obviously, this is obviously eastward and upper of the Levant. See that E1B1B? E1, B, one, B? That's actually E1B1B. You see it mingling with those RAs there. Note the RA, RA. We're gonna look back at that. You see R, R, 2A and different things like that. You see what's going on over here? We're gonna take a look at this mingling that's going on over here because this mingling over time is why we're seeing this. This mingling over time is why we're seeing this. So let's take, let's take a look at it. So it's very interesting and very uh, detailed. Let's go up, let's go over. Okay, so here's the early Bronze Age, right? Let's take a look here. So obviously we wanna look in this area over here. We wanna take a look in these areas over here, right? Here's Israel, Israel's over there. So these are gonna be some other different areas over here. The reason why is because this group over here later sweeps down into the Levant and is also known and people actually think that they are the um, original people. But you're going to take a note of this group here. You see this group? 
See that E1, B1, B there? And that J2, right? It says excluding J2. It's a J lineage excluding J2. So like probably J1 more, more sets, more in uh, understanding. E1, B1, B. See what's going on there? We're going to take a look at another time frame. Okay, so that was early. Early Bronze Age. Here's the Middle Bronze Age. Let's take a look. You can also look at the MT DNA, which we're going to look at that a little later on. And I'm going to show you how in ancient times, their MT DNA, the females line of many of the Ashkenazis were by the Rhineland in ancient times. Um, in fact, I'll show you that right now. So right here, we had talked about that yesterday, right? We talked about how they found right here by the Rhine, right? The Rhine River, ancient times. When did Israel go to the Rhine River? When was the time that Israel came to the Rhine River? This is the ancient, this is ancient genetics that's found by the Rhine River. And these, all these genetics we're gonna look at um, is actually in Ashkenaz. But let's go over here. As always, it's all about truth. Um, never be all about um, what's the word I'm looking for. Never be, never, if you're if you're any of these Havlo groups, don't be offended by the facts. Never be offended by the facts, but always accept them. Um, because this actually opens up the book. The evidence here actually opens up the book. So see what we see here? Obviously, our lineage is up there, right? That's without a doubt. We know that the R lineage is a European lineage. RA is up there and everything. Let's go down a little bit and see that spot that we was keeping watch of. Okay, so over here. All right. So we got a whole party going on over here. You know, look what's going on over here in this area. You got your J, your J1A right there. Right, you got your J lineage. Let's go down a little bit. Right, because they come in the the time that they sweep in is about the thousands, about um, the thousands and thousand AD around that time. So here we go, J one A, and then you got your excluding J two, and you have right here E one B one B. You see what's going on there? You got your R lineages, they're barely close. You got your R lineages and your Q lineages very close. So you're gonna see this J and this E get closer and closer to these ones. So you see what's going on there? What's this E doing up here? I thought this E was actually African, right? Don't they say the E lineage is African? You ever seen that? When they say the E, if you're not familiar with Havlo, with these things, it's okay. But they they say themselves that E1B1B is African. But E1B1B is actually Arabian. That's actually very important. That's not actually African. So you actually see is up there hanging out in the upper areas in the Bronze Age, right? J lineages, E lineages, Right, R lineages, um, E1B1B, never E1B1A, but E1B1B. Go over here. E1B1A is actually going to be the lineage of Israel. That's actually the real lineage of Israel. Um, but watch what you see right here, and you can see geneticists will tell you the truth of E1B1A. M2, they'll tell you M2, and I have a quote M2 from a geneticist from Family Tree DNA that tells you M2, M2 has a possibility of a back migration. Um, in fact, it does have a back migration. Let's see if it's in the, on this map, on this year. I don't know which year I just clicked. Actually, Bronze Age late. Let's see. You see some J's coming with the R's. Look at that E. Look at that E lineage right there. Let me zoom in a little bit. You see what I'm showing you here? You see that E lineage right there? What is that E lineage doing higher than the R lineage and the J lineage? You see what's going on over there? Why are, they, why are they mixing over here? Why are they, why are they hanging out in this area? You see what's going on? So they've been up there for a minute. So I showed you the different ages that that E lineage was over there. The reason why I want to show you that is because these mixes, you're constantly will see E1B1B there, right? Not E1B1A, but E1B1B, right? So a lot of times you'll see that E1B1B. That's actually your Arabic line. That's your real original Arabic line. So you see your E1B1B there? A lot of E1B1B. E1B1B. Oh, no. That's all the rest after that is subclads, right? So subgroups and whatnot. But they're always going to have um, three, what is it? Um, M35 and M34. That's always what they're going to have. E1B1B, M34 or M35 underneath that branch. So you can see right here, very interesting, very, very interesting to see these things. So you can see the, obviously, the E's and the J's and whatnot in the area and the R's and whatnot, R2 and, and T's, right? You got your T's there as well. All and, and what area are we looking at? What area is actually we looking at? Because this is actually a challenge that geneticists have made with each other and they wanted to find out um, who was actually um, in the areas of the Slavs and whatnot. But you can see different ones in different areas. Right, you can see these different areas, right? Hungarian, you, all these things, Poland, right? Polish. Remember, we know that the Poland Polish 
and the Russians, we actually know that they are going to be um, having that Slavic language. That's very important. They're going to have that Slavic language. So they noted this, that right here, it says new, basically make it easy. Um, they just talk about E, J, and I was basically mixing together. And that's what we note. We know that E, J, and I um, and R is constantly in history mixing together, but obviously having different fathers. That's very important. In fact, that's actually one of the things that they quote when they're doing this um, study is that they also note that what they're actually pulling out is actually genetic lineages. As it says right here, blood samples were collected from healthy, unrelated adults after attaining information consent, right? Inf informed consent, right? Because they also took genetics of modern people, compared them to ancient people to see where they all fit in the land. And they had that all plotted down also on this little thing. Now, what's interesting about this thing that they had did here, right? They have it all plotted out where they are, with how much numbers and whatnot, where they are. What's interesting about this thing is that this thing right here is actually a separate study um, on the slobs that didn't really come to light, but it should. It absolutely should, because what it actually does paint is that it paints a perfect picture of what you see in the Ashkenaz, right? You see your J's, you see your E's, you see your R's, you see your G's, you see your Q's, you see your T's, you see your I's. You see all those lineages that I just showed you there because all those lineages were mingling together in different areas. Now, the I lineage, what's interesting about the I lineage is that you don't find it more on this area. You find it more um, towards the this area over here, right? You can see your eyes there, your eyes over here. So you see eyes over, over here, but eyes come from J. Right, eyes come from J. Um, sometimes they're in between the R's, right? They're in between the R lineage. You can see your J's right there. So whenever you see a R, whenever you see an I, J is not that far from it, right? Because they actually started together. That you started together. In actually Neolithic Greece, in ancient Greece, the J lineage was one of the dominant lineages in Greece. So J lineage up here past the uh, where you see the mountains right here. So that's actually very important um, to note those things, right? E one B one B right there, you can see that. So it's very important to know that a lot of times, and he's gonna talk about it here, he's gonna talk about that a lot of these genetics, you gotta know how they got here, right? How did this, now look at, this is the Bronze Age. How did the R lineage get here and the J lineage get here? Is this Israel? Is this actually Israel? He's gonna talk about that too. That is actually important to know how did this J get here and how does R get here? We talked about that in a couple of different videos. Um, the R lineage, the reason why the R lineage is there is because R1B, just to show you that, right here go down a little bit and that's what he's going to also talk about in this video let me actually go to where that's directly said right here so who is r1b r1b is actually the c peoples in fact they find their lineage we already know we just seen it like thousands of times upper in the um, north that's what's also connected with the sea peoples that became known as the philistines right the philistines in the sense of the biblical narrative we know that they're hamites but the Japhonites actually came down and invaded the areas that the Canaanites and the, the Hamites named, right? They named the places after their names, but they invaded those places and were settled in those places and still took the names of those places. Um, and we know that because we have writings from Ramses when the confederations came down there and he names all the different confederations, um, that it, was, it wasn't just one group, but it was multiple groups. And that's what we find that came down there into that area. Um, for example, this thing is that the sea peoples behind the Philistines were Aegeans, including R1B, including, right? Because R1B is one lineage and there's other lineages that's found there. For example, there's another lineage that's found there, such as the lineage. I don't know if I even opened that one on here. Let me see. Yes. The, the other lineage that's found there is a J lineage, right? They have a J lineage there, and that lineage is actually the Turkish lineage, right? When I say Turkish, obviously Turks wasn't there at that time, but Turkish as in is, is dominant in the Turks. It's a dominant lineage in the Turks. So here you can see it, and it's actually that P, JP58. JP58 was found in Sidon in two males. Now, what's important is, if you don't know maps, Right. This one, we have to pull up a biblical map so that we can see Sidon. Now, why is why is it important to find someone in Sidon um, in contrast to just find them in the Levant? Because Sidon was an area that if you see on any type of uh, map with the tribes, it always goes around Sidon, Phoenician. Why? Because that was a strong area. They was very powerful. 
Um, and also they couldn't go in there. That was one of those areas that, that was just the area um, when you see Tyra and, and Sidon, it was like a trade area where they had a lot of trade and it was basically um, just a separate area, separate from Israel. Um, and you'll notice that also when we had went over some of the things of the homeland of, of the E lineage. But you also can see here, you see how they curved there? That's Sidon and that's Tyra, right? That was no Israelites at that in that area. And also, this is very early on. When the Israelites crossed the river, we can track where they went, right? They went into these areas and different areas of there. Sidon was one of those areas that the Sea People settled at very early. And that's what we actually find is that the genetics of the Sea Peoples are actually found there. And that's what makes it very interesting. So the J, the reason why you see the J lineage there, don't, don't get shocked from that. The R R1B and the J lineage, don't be, don't, don't get too hyper from that. And he's gonna talk about that. Because when this when this information came out, everyone was getting they everyone got super excited. They said the, the Ashkenaz have to be the people because they found them in the Levant, but where in the Levant in Sidon, and that has to be understood in what it's saying. So even in a sense of the paper, they even said where they came from, and that's what we just looked at at the Zagros Mountains above the Zagros Mountains in the Caucasus, um, in those areas. That's where we find their lineage in ancient times. In ancient times, not um, later, but earlier. That's very important. So that's who the real sea peoples are, is, is that they actually were a European confederation that came together and decided in a time when Israel was actually coming out of, remember, Israel came out of Africa, out of out of Egypt, right? They came out of Africa. And remember, they were in persecution for, uh, what was it, almost uh, hundreds of years, right? Hundreds of years in the lower areas, right, in captivity. So it's very important to know their, their, their genetics will be all over that area. Because remember what they were doing to the males, they were killing them, putting in the Nile, right? The Nile has a long stretch. That's very important. We can follow the Nile all the way down into a lower part of Egypt, all the way to where you see um, pretty much the uh, Ethiopia, right? That's very important to know, right? Going down, it actually stretches really far. You can see it turns to the White Nile and whatnot and goes all the way down. But what's also important is they was actually in this area. So this is where we should expect to find um, any genetics of Israel. We should find their genetics in the land of Egypt. But finding lineages up here means that means they're excluded from being Israel because ancient times for someone to be up here. That's why you ever seen where they show that um, if you ever look it up, if you type down Ashkenaz, you can find some very interesting stuff. They'll say Ashkenaz are Europeans. Why is that such a, a, a mind blowing thing? because they can't be Europeans because Israel is recorded in being in the South, right? Israel is recorded being down here, not up here. Israel's is never recorded being up here into uh, later on when the Syrians came and stuff like that, um, when they start moving up or in these areas. But we also got to keep in record the understanding of what happened to the Israelites that went into these areas. They didn't actually keep on going up. They actually went back down. That's very important. But what you're seeing today is actually the illustration of these things, which we need to look at. I don't know why it just bent like this. I don't even know how it bent like this, to be honest with you. But yeah, that happened. Let me go over here. So I, the reason why I want to show you this is because ancient, first we got to look at ancient genetics and look at these things and see if we can match these things with ancient genetics, ancient genetics, not modern genetics, but ancient genetics. That's very important. That's very, very important. Um, but I'm going to go, remember how we talked about these uh, Serbi Serbians, how we see right here, this group. Now, this group is really interesting because they have the T with them. When I say the T, they have a T group. Now, the T group, they actually are going to be more closer to your E1B1B. Why? Um, because C and T actually makes the E and D lineage, but also it's recorded. It's actually recorded very early on. Let me see. I actually went too low on this one. I'm just going to leave this right here. I'm going to go over here and go down here. Here's a quote about the E lineage and what happened when it went upwards because the E lineage is also found in Levant, right? We had talked about that and whatnot. The E lineage is found in Levant. This is also an ancient picture right here. This is a very um, ancient picture right now. You can see Mesolithic, whatnot. But going up a little bit, let me show you something what it said here. When they went up there during that time, it's actually recorded. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read this to you. So it's 2016, tested the first ancient DNA samples in the Mesolithic Natufian culture in Israel. Possibly the world's oldest, uh, obviously the culture that's found there, you gotta also note the late Natufian E1B1B, right? 
coming from CT and E1B1A, just to make it a little um, understanding. Obviously, that's one of the oldest finds they found, right? And found that the male individuals belong either to haplogroups CT or E1B, right? E1B, including two from E1B1B1, pretty much B, pretty much two samples. These are to date, to date, the oldest known E1B1B individuals. That means E1B1B doesn't originate in Africa, right? That's actually very important. E lineage, D lineage, those are not African lineages. A and B is more African lineages, right? Because we can't look at modern genetics and say that they always been there. We got to look at migrations of peoples. Ancient genetics, fossil, fossil, fossil genetics in a location is more going to give you a uh, genetic location because they actually are frozen in a place where it's actually ancient times, right? They're going to be in a place where they are at the time where they were long ago, right? So obviously, no one really is going to... Um, you know, die. And then after they die, they're going to, you know, carry their bones out unless they're Joseph. Right. So this is actually very important. Now, this part right here is actually very important. Let me read it. These are today the oldest known E1B1B individuals, the same haplogroups, watch what it says here, the same haplogroups show up in pre-pottery Neolithic B Jordan, accompanied by new haplogroups H2 and T. Now that's the reason why I want to show you T because T is actually known to have traveled when it when when E1B1B went upwards, they came back with a T group with T and H. They came back with European groups. So when the Arabians actually went up, they actually started to mix with the Europeans. What what would that do? That would cause them to start to become more lighter skin. In fact, we had looked at that the other day when we was looking at some of the genetics of the people in the Crusades. They had E1B1B and they had J, um, as in uh, the MTJ, as in the mother's line, as in the female's lineage, which is actually very interesting because that means that E1B1B was mixing very early um, with the lineages of the lineage that you see, you're going to see today. So go over here. So we're going to obviously look at these things um, as you see, very, very pinpoint. So we're gonna look at his information very pinpoint um, just to get on these things very closely. So getting a good idea of these things is gonna be very good, uh, such as this E1B1B. So I'm gonna show a little bit of information on E1B1B and why um, also it's important to know. Now, if you wanna get a clear um, picture of E1B1B, I would recommend typing this E-M123. If you type down E-123, you'll see, uh, let me see if I can find it. It's usually not so hard to find. Right here, you see this, this video right here? Whoever made this video, they really put a lot of pe different people. What, what this actually is, E-M123 is actually a, that's actually going to be your autosomal. But autosomal in connection is actually connected to E1B1B. That autosomal is actually connected to E1B1B. And it takes a lot of different people in E1B1B from different parts of the world and shows you um, different things. So it's very interesting. It's very interesting video um, on those things right here. Maybe I'll add it uh, to the description of these things. Very, very interesting video. But continuing onward, as you can see, many of these groups have E1B1B. Just keep that in mind, right? Just to show you that they say that that's an African group. You probably already know about it. Uh, let's look at... Uh, type, let's see if I just type homeland, would it just put Africa? Not E1B1A, but E1B1B. Let's see if I can find it, homes. Home homes. Uh, I don't know what that is. All right. That's to make it a little simple. Right, because you can find E1B1B all in these areas, large portions up here, different areas like this. It's one of those lineages that we actually find in Af in uh, the upper areas, but they'll say that it's African lineage. You see what's going right here? They'll say that it's African and whatnot, but we got to know the history. Remember, we had looked at that, what Flavius Josephus said about the sons of Keturah and everything and where they went. They went into Africa, right? They went into Africa, but they also was into different areas in Saudi Arabia, right? And they also went upward in these areas, when? During the time of the Bronze Age collapse, during the time of the Bronze Age collapse. 
I'm gonna show a little bit of something here, 1025. And as always, if you have any questions on any of these things, definitely ask. So here's when here's when the E1B1B actually went upwards in the Bronze Age. And that's what we remember we was looking at that, just genetics during the Bronze Age, that they went upwards. ...and other highly prized resources in their remote citadels. The people of the wasteland had very little wealth, which the Bronze Age empires could extort from them, so they were usually left alone. The wastelanders periodically visited the region's cities and traded sheepskins and other assorted loot with the settled peoples. But their most notable rule in pre-collapsed Bronze Age society was as mercenaries. So obviously today, y'all willing, we're just going to focus on this video, this one. But we're going to go over it live and talk about the E1B1B and how they went up here and how they basically came up during the Bronze Age collapse. And they took these areas, they took over here, they, they reached in different areas. That's very important to know that the Arabs, they moved upwards during the Bronze Age collapse. And we can find the genetic information for that. Um, let's keep on going with this as I think it's very important just to have the stability of truth with the genetics on what actually is going on. So when we're looking at this thing, when we're seeing these mixes of genetics and everything, which is over here, not this one, but let's see. I have so many notes open. Actually, this one. Let me go down to the place where those are right here. So when we see E1B, E1B, just keep in mind, that's why. The reason why is because that's actually the real shemetic line. That's the real shemetic line. Let's keep on going. Uh, the reason it is called demographic miracle is because the uh, it requires us to assume that Ashkenazi Jews reproduced at a, uh, experienced a baby boom uh, um, uh, expansion rate for 500 years um, at a time where um, some of European nations have been uh, contracted because of black death and, and so forth um, that growth rate is unima uh, is unimaginable and and it cannot be generated um, through normal reproduction rate hence the, the demographic miracle uh, the alternative hypothesis is called the um, the uh, uh, slavo uh, Irano-Turkish hypothesis uh, suggests that um, at, at some point Iranian uh, Jewry became very well developed, um, initially founded uh, by uh, travelers, uh, supplemented by exiles uh, from from Israel in, in Judea, and um, of course um, by by that time they uh, there was no not much of Israel left, but the Judeans uh, took the name Israel. Um, at some point, those uh, Jewish traders arrived to uh, to the Black Sea, Slavic lands, um, and and crossed the Caucasus Mountains. They influenced a religious reform in the Kafka in, in the uh, Khazarian Empire, uh, where the Khazar elites converted to Judaism. Um, Many other people converted at the same time, including uh, uh, Slavs and, and, and other uh, people who wanted to take part of this Jewish trade. Um, at that time, they began using uh, Pradesh, uh, the Slavic version uh, of Yiddish. Um, after Khazaria collapsed, uh, those Jews um, penetrated Europe uh, from, from, its, uh, from the east. They moved west from the Khazarian Empire to Europe. After they arrived in Germany, um, they became began adapting uh, uh, Germanic words into their uh, pre yiddish language that they had that had that, that had a, a Slavic base, Slavic grammar, um, and this is how Yiddish became to sound like German, um, and and eventually they reached um, Western Europe and the remaining part of Europe. Okay, um, now. Uh, the two hypotheses um, uh, um, count and classify the number of... Uh, All right, so this part right here, keep in mind that when you're looking at the... Let me actually pull this up here real fast so I know what is, where it's at. Let me actually pull this, this one closer here. The reason why is because note 
that most of these are actually Japhetic, right? We can trace these and find out where they're from, and we can see them in ancient times in Europe. Right here, you're going to see your E lineage is actually Shemitic. You see what you see right here? This E lineage right here. Now, this is actually important because if we actually look at the order of the Slavic language, which is actually showing here, we actually see a small portion as Hebrew, right? That's actually important because it's actually a Shemitic language. That's actually what is actually part of this. It's a Shemitic language. And that's who that was. That's actually a Shemite. The E1B1B is actually a Shemite. And that's why they have a portion of that Hebrew. But it's also important to note that they're mainly going to have Germanic languages and Slavic languages. That's important. That's very important. Why? Because the large portion of this language is also going to talk about as being in connection to the Silk Road. Why is that important? Connection to the Silk Road. Because the people in the Silk Road, in fact, there's a there's something I'm going to show when he gets there, um, as I think it's very important to know about Pontus, right? The reason why I think it's important because everyone want to focus on the area of the Khazaria, right? The Khazar, that area is just named after the area of the sea, those little seas right there. The little water right there is what's called Khazar. But there's a place that we're going to talk about today right here, Pontus. That's actually very important in connection to these things that actually they had during a time of the Byzantine area, they actually moved upwards. That's very important to understand into Khazaria. Khazaria was actually a mingled area where many people in that area was actually mingling and mixing together. Um, so very interesting to see. But before we even touch on this right here, before we even touch on that, let me actually go down a little bit to see where that spot is. I want to make sure I don't want to fly past it. It's actually up here a little bit. One up here. All right. So he's going to talk about this test that he's going to do. And obviously, it's going to be in this area. The reason why I'm talking about Pontus is because notice this area right here, right? It's going to be mainly in this area with these names here, right? You can see some of these names here. We're going to touch on this because it's very detailed because this test that he did from 2013 to 2006, others did it. Other, other people did the test and they got pretty much the same results. They pretty much landed in around the same area, um, which is very important. I'm going to go up a little bit, right? So right here, Pontus. I'm going to talk a little bit about it and the connection with it and whatnot. Um, but first, before we even touch on it, um, let me just let it play a little bit before we get there because I want to let you see this in a proper order. Um, this video is very deep, but it also, you know, you got to understand what he's talking about here when he's talking about these things. Long story short, I guess to summarize it while we continue, he's going to pretty much bring as much evidence as possible to the table as, you know, as you should do with all things and show that what he actually found is not an idea, but a fact. And, and trace them back to their supposedly parental language in, in two different ways. The random hypothesis suggests that most of the words in Yiddish have Germanic bases with a little bit of Slavic and, and a tiny bit of Hebrew. Uh, the slavo irano turkic hypothesis suggests that actually most of the words are from Slavic origin. The remaining are German or Germanoid. Um, that means sounds like German, but, but not really. And I can give you a contemporary word. Um, the word Ashkenazim, which is very common uh, commonly used. Uh, it, it sounds like English, but it is not. There is no I am to mention plural in English. This is this is a Hebrew word uh, that is written in, in an English way, and people use it as such, but this is very poor English. Um, if you want to say Ashkenaz in plural, and we say Ashkenazic or Ashkenaz, it's kind of kind of hurts, but that's the way it should be. Um, so, so that's what it means. Um, uh, the Eid edition. Um, now, uh, another way of thinking of these two hypotheses is that the random hypothesis uh, suggests that if it sounds like a duck, then it's a duck, whereas the Slavic, Irano, uh, Turkic hypothesis says that uh, no, it may look like a fish, but actually you have to cut it and, and, and look at the internal organization. And just because it swims and, and looks like a fish, it, it's actually a, a completely different. Uh, so that's why we had looked at the Slavic language when we first looked at this, because that's what he's actually getting down to, looking at the linguistics, because he's going to later, he's going to break down the genetics. 
But first, he wants to have the full connection, right? Language and genetics and those things to find out who they are and everything. Um, what's interesting about the illustration that he's illustrating here um, by pointing out the language of Yiddish, I mean, all you have to do is really see what is it under. Is it underneath? What family tree is it underneath? It's underneath the right here. It's actually underneath German. But it actually has connections with the Slavic language. And that's what we're going to look at, too, the whole picture on how these things are connected. For example, speaking of Slavs, uh, remember how I showed you how the Slavic language, right? Let me just click this, see if it opens up uh, fairly fast here, right here. All right, so the reason why I wanted to open this up is because I want you to see this little Slavic language that's over here because this Slavic language that's over here is actually going to be connected to Russia. Why am I, why am I constantly talking about Russia, right? You're probably wondering why I'm, I'm talking about Russia, right? Because Russia is actually what destroyed the Khazarian Empire. It wasn't called Russia at that time, but it was called Rus. It's called Rus. You've probably seen that in the Bible. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a part in the Bible that uh, you got to look at it in the Hebrew to see what's actually there. Um, that would actually be in your basically Ezekiel. Here, I'll go to it real fast. 39. At least I believe it's Ezekiel 39. Let me look here. In fact, I think it's 38. Let's take a look here. And I'm going to show you it in the Hebrew real fast. See if I can find one with the, just a regular text. All right, I just click this. All right, so let me show you something real fast on this one. Let me just close these as we don't need those. I'm just gonna go to this. Obviously it's not this one, but it's gonna be over. So we see what's going on here. Son of man, right? Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. See what's saying right there? Rosh, what's saying right there? This is actually going to be Rus. But the, the, the best way to understand this um, is actually, this is actually Rus, is what it's talking about here. Um, let's look at that. Let's go over here and let's, let's go down a little bit, right? Slavic language, Russia, the ones who took down the people. Um, the reason why I'm going to show you this because I'm going to show you something else. But right here is actually Rus, right? Became the Russians, how Rus became the Russians, pretty much. Um, this is just going to be in the description of this video of connections. I'm not going to play it. I'm just going to give the summary of it. So Russia, long story short, it began as Rus. This is actually Rus right here. This is pretty much it. You can look it up as R-U-S, -R right? You can get a little idea on them. That's actually the origins of Russia, right? They're actually the ones that took down Kazaria. The, why did they take down Kazaria? They got jealous, pretty much. Long story short is that they wanted the money. They wanted the money that Kazars were bringing in. Um, the Kazars were very powerful people. And that's what he's looking at today because Kazars actually spoke Yiddish. How do we know that they spoke Yiddish? Because we have a document, word for word, of what happened. So conquest of a continent, expansion of races right here. This was in 1933. And we can see what's said about here. It just talks about what not many of the Khazars and their kin were converted by Jewish missionaries and they formally accepted Judaism in 740 AD, right? It is doubtful whether there is a single drop of the old Palestinian, Semitic uh, Palestinian because um, Israel changed the name to Pal the area, right? Remember they had changed the land name to Palestine, to Palestine, whatnot. Semitic speaking Hebrew blood amongst these East European Jews. So they say that they're actually East European because, you know, you think of Britain and all that stuff, there's going to be more westward, but more central eastward is where you're going to get a lot of Khazarian. And why do they also call them um, eastward? Because Khazars actually are a branch of people. I'm going to keep this right here, but they are a branch of people of the Gog Turks, right? If you never heard of the Gog Turks, they're just a branch of the Gog Turks when it broke. And the Gog Turks, just to make it um, a quick illustration, I don't know why this thing looks like this. I might refresh it. But the Gog Turks came from this area, and they that as far as they reached this area, it was a very large group. But then they split, and that's where the Khazars came from, from the Gog Turks. It was actually a branch of the of the Gog Turks. They were actually Turks. Um, in fact, going back over here, I'm gonna close some of these as we don't need these open now, and this one. You'll need that open now. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna close that. 
All right, so let's let's actually understand what 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 I'm talking about here is pretty much in summary that I'm gonna go up a little bit. I'm just gonna read you something um, right here because remember I was showing you the genetics of this people and the how you say Serbians and all that, and then you see how they actually a mingled company, right? We've seen that they're actually not one group but many, right? Just keep that in mind that they're a mingled company. They're not one Hablo group but many, many different Hablo types, right? I'm going to read a little bit something here, right? Um, continuously inhabited just talks about that place, right? It talks about that it was continuously inhabited since the um, Paleolithic age. The territory of modern day, uh, what's that, Serbia faced Slavic migrations, right? In the sixth century. So that area is filled, right? We looked at that area, the genetics of it. You can see the genetics here, a little bit of it actually right up here. See what's going on right there? So you see these genetics and everything. I'm gonna go up a little bit so you can see who it is, right? E1, B1, B, R1, R lineages and J's, right? Turks, the J's are Turks. He's actually gonna be in you found your Turks. And actually, um, if anyone wants to, I'm gonna actually this day put a link in the description. If someone doesn't agree with these things, you can always join me and we can have a holy conversation on these things. Um, obviously, humble and docile without any cursing and any fighting. But we can go about these things and have an intellectual uh, understanding of these things. Now let's go down a little bit and let's look at these things. And if you agree with it, amen. Because this is actually the truth what you're seeing today. So right here, E1, B1, B, R, I, J's, of course. You got your R lineages there. Let me go down a little bit. That's what it's talking about there. Let's talk about it. Let's see what, what's going on there. So a lot of Slavs came to that area. So that's what you've seen, the genetics of the Slavs. That doesn't mean one group. It means multiple groups, right? Just keep that in mind. Let me go back up. I don't want to go too uh, far. Let me read this right here first. All right, so obviously a migration into this area that I just showed you in the 6th century, right? Establishing several region states, regional states in the early Middle Ages at times recognized as obviously tribute, obviously being part of the um, Byzantines and the Frankish and the Hungarian kingdoms, right? Being tributes, being tribu tributaries to them, right? Basically working for them. And also notice it says the Middle Ages. So if we if we actually look, that's one we didn't look at yet, the Middle Ages, right? This 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 little thing, obviously the in the description is gonna be a note of notes. You're going to see it as note of notes, and it'll be a note of many notes. Let me go over here. I'm going to go to when I mean, we looked at the Bronze Age, right? And we've seen how old this goes. This goes up to the, the Middle Age, pretty much, right here. Late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, these ages and whatnot, um, antiquities, and then you have your Middle Ages. I'm just going to click the, the – this is the – as Late as it goes, this is a site that goes to your basically roots of who peoples are. Very interesting because you know, once you understand it, it shows you who peoples are. You know, when you think about that, that's absolutely groundbreaking. You know, that's very interesting to see who peoples are. Go down a little bit. So, what's interesting I noticed about these areas, the ones that we kept seeing over here moved. They moved, they're not over here no more. Right, middle middle ages, because the the migration of peoples, the moving of peoples, right? Remember, we had noted an E lineage over here. See some J's all the way over there. You can see J's over here, down here. You see what's going on there. But what happened during the Middle Ages? The the Arab groups united, right? The the Arab groups actually united and became one little party. Just seeing if we see an E lineage over here. Might be one up there. There's one right there. Up in the air. Up there. That's actually a way above the Caucasus, as you can see right there. The E lineages, right? Mingling together. Here's some E lineages over here. You can see what's going on there. You know why that's important? It's because that E lineage is a major lineage, right? They, that's actually a major lineage that you see in a lot of these groups. You can see some J's. Look at this mingled part. E1, B1, B. And we had looked at that. And what spot is this? This is this is Greece, right? You see right there? And a little bit up is the area of the Slavs. 
So you see what we're looking at here? So we're proving it by the ancient genetics. So in the Middle Ages, E1, B1, B up there, and there's J's, right? Different ones. Remember, we have seen them mingling before, right? The J ends too. So ends are over here as well. So you got some ends over here. You got your G's. So you got some G's, some, um, obviously a, a lot of mixing going on, right? Especially in this area, especially in this area right here. Very, very uh, mingled, very mingled um, company in this area. So very, very interesting. Right above Greece, right? Right next to Italy, where you can see right here, where you say Rome. So right above Greece. And that's what we were looking at. We were looking at those genetics in that area because in that area, we see some interesting things. So what's interesting about this is that that group became contributaries to the Byzantine, the Franks, and the Hungarian kingdoms. You can see that kingdom obviously being recognized by the Holy See. When they say Holy See, it's just that, remember we talked about that, that barbarian group that they were making and everything. I'm gonna go down a little bit and read you something else real fast. So what's interesting is that the Khazars actually had a tie in with the Romans, right? And that's what we're looking at today is that he's actually breaking down the Yiddish origin and that the Yiddish origin, in fact, I didn't, I don't think I read that part on this part. Wait, remember how I said that the Khazars obviously didn't have any Palestinian or what they say, Palestinian Levi, Levite blood or whatnot, right? Israeli blood, just to make it simple, right? They don't have any of the Shemitic speaking Hebrew blood amongst them. Um, but also notice this, they are essentially a non-European people. The language they speak, Yiddish or Yiddish, is a corrupt German. And obviously, remember um, when we think about the Franks and everything, just talk about Frank dialect mixed with Slavic and Hebrew elements. And that's what, and this is obviously 1933. And that's what this um, genesis is bringing out in 2013 later on. This, this is in 1933, but this already knew that the language that they were speaking, um, obviously being connection with the obviously Hebrew element, which fact strengthens the tradition of a large migration of German Jews into Poland in the Middle Ages, right? We've seen that. Look at the genetics. We're looking at the Middle Ages. We've seen all these things and how we have that thing um, happening. Let's, let's read a little more. It may be that the strand of these German Jews has died out. Did, see how the person thinks that maybe, you know, maybe they're not that what they were before, but they are the same, right? Leaving only their language behind. But in any event, the Polish Jews are now distinctly, distinctly, distinctly Alpine, right? A mixture of Slavs and of Asiatic invaders of Russia, of Russia, right? We had talked about that. Remember how we talked about how Russia had basically invaded them and everything? Very interesting history on what Russia did to them, right? Very, very interesting history. And also, we're going to look at the genetics, obviously, of Russia and of Germany, because that's actually important because that's a confederacy. It's not different peoples, but rather it's confederacies. There's a lot of confederacies going on. For example, Russia. Let's look at Russia and see what we see. Now, let's go back over here and let's look at the genetics of the Ashkenaz. So this is what you see. Now, obviously understand what I'm saying is people that call themselves Ashkenaz is what they usually find. They don't find one haplotype, but they always find multiple different ones. But let's look at what it says right here. Um, very interesting. Here's what it says, the top four haplo groups among the samples of Russians, right? Here's the top four, R1A. Now R1A was, is really interesting because R1A so happens to be during the bottleneck, during when the people had a bottleneck, um, they actually had one of those ones. Let me go up a little bit. Uh, a little lower. Some other pieces of information to go over. Um, but let me go down a little bit and talk about this right here, the bottleneck. All right. So recent Ashkenazi Jewish history from whole, um, obviously, genome suggests a bottleneck of merely... 350 individuals. You probably heard of that, right? The bottleneck of 350 individuals. But notice what is actually in the bottleneck. All right, it says that while this bottleneck does not necessarily coincide with the founding effective uh, male population size and event for Ashkenazi Jews, it, watch what it says here. It does tell us that the Ashkenazi Levite, they say Levite, R1A, R1A ancestor was likely among the founding males upon whom the bottleneck applied. So when they had the bottleneck, it would have had a R1A in there. That's very important. That means that R1A would be rooted 
in them. That'd be a root when they had bottleneck, when the bottleneck had happened, um, as they almost like a thousand years ago, as they constantly kept growing and increasing, that's one of the lineages that we see when we look at the lineage of the peoples, because that lineage R1A is actually going to be in connection with the Scythians. See this one right here? RM198 and RM269. Those are going to be your R1 and R1A, R1A and R1B lineages. So you're going to actually have a good picture of the illustration of who peoples are, right? You're getting a, a very interesting picture. And that's what the geneticist is doing. And, and understand, his work is actually um, obviously downplayed because no one wants to see it because you know how it is. If I already talked about this before, uh, what would happen if someone would see such a thing and, and realize that the people that are there are actually not at the real Jews, right? We had talked about this before. It can be strongly argued um, that the contemporary R1A would not Levites descend from a single, from a single Levite, they say Levite, Levite, they say Levite, right? But we, we found them in ancient times up in the north. Ancestor who arrived in Europe from the Levant, arrived in Europe from the Levant, but rather was in the Levant. The, the expansion of his direct male lineage began in a time frame compatible with the expansion pattern observed for several additional additional founding fathers of Ashkenazi descent, pretty much. Jewelry, what they say. Very important that they don't have one founding father, but they have multiple, right? Just keep that in mind that they actually have mingled company. That's a very important thing. Keep in mind as a mingled company. Go up a little bit more, right? A little bit more information on R1A. I'm not going to keep on going on it. We already talked about it. It's a connection of the Scythians. That's one of those things that also the video is going to talk about. Now, remember how I showed you when we looked at that, right? R1A is a high percentage in Russia. We also got I, right? I and J is connected. You got your I, seven, a large percentage, right? You got your Ns, right? That's that's not as common in the um, Ashkenaz, but you see that they were mingling. I showed you a spot where they were mingling at, right? With the Ns and everything. So you can see where they're mingling. Connection, connection, connection. And then you have, obviously you have your R1B. So R1A and R1B, obviously, that's what you're going to find there. Also, what else they have? They have Js, right? They have Js, right? They talk about those other ones as well that they have there. Um, not as high because the J is actually going to be more of the Turkish lineage. But Russia uh, seems like a Turk, but rather Russia is, is actually a different lineage. It's actually a different lineage. Um, Russia is going to be more of the Scythians and things like that, of that sort. Um, but the Js is going to be more of the Turks. And we had talked about that before when we talked about jay but let's let's look a little more into this obviously you know if you don't know about the gog turks very interesting history to check out how they got a connection of the east with the gog turks so just a confederation that's all that it really is it's just confederations that's all that they really are they're, they're the same relate related people but you have confederations now the reason why that's important is because what you're seeing today is the full picture of the truth of these things and not just um watered down, you know, push things aside message, but actually looking at the things um, directly, right? You haven't, if you haven't seen the connection with Leo, uh, the fourth, the Khazar, Leo, the, the Khazar and how he got connection with Rome, very important history, happened in the 1700s, very important history with that because Rome, believe it or not, was afraid of the Khazars. When I say afraid of the Khazars, some people will say no, but they were, you know what, you know how we know they were afraid? because they wanted to make a union with them and marry in with them. They Rome actually was basically wooing them so that they can be one with the Khazars because the Khazars was actually very strong, very, very strong, like Scythian strong. Uh, if you don't know about the Scythians, they, they destroyed um, the first leaders of Persia, very important, and, and Assyria. Um, so they have a play in all of history. So here's Russia, let's look at, now let's look at, let's close this and let's look at Germany. Let's go to Germany. And let's take a look at Germany, right? Are they, are they related, right? Because what is the thing about Israel? We got to be honest, family. We have to be honest. Israel has a Hablo group, would have a Hablo group that no one else has but Arabs. That's very important. Arabs, um, what else? Uh, obviously, finding Ammon and, and Edom and whatnot, you'll find a different subclad of them, right? having a little differentness to them. But here's a little picture. Here's um, taking the Ashkenazi, who they say the Levite, right? And the Kohen, how they say Kohen? 
Let's go down and look at the, obviously, the German groups, right? You can actually get a clear understanding of what it is just by seeing this right here. So R1A, R1A is what, what they basically were looking at right here. So right here, you can see some related, right? Some not, why? Because J's, you got different groups. Some are related, right? Right here, especially this one, who they call the Ashkenazi Levite, right? You see how I put that red there? So right there is going to add, because the reason why is like this, because I had to cut this one, cut this one off and put this together so that you can see it all together. Um, because this is actually on a site where it with a long list, with a long list of things. And you can actually see that site right on here, R1A. Just type in R1A and then you know, you can find who is all connected and whatnot. So you can see a decent you know, piece of information on these things. Um, I guess just to make it simple is that, yes, they, they have some connection to the Germans. Long story short is that they have some connection to the Germans. They're highly related um, with the Germans in many different ways, right? Hitler as well, right? All of them, a lot of them are highly related. It's very important, very, very important to look at. So that's why I want to show you that, obviously, having the same lineages and everything is, is very important. I'm gonna go up a little bit. So what you just saw a little bit right there was the connection with languages, right? Connection with Russ, right? Remember I told you how Russ was jealous and wanted to basically attack the place and take the riches that the Khazars had. Uh, if you've never seen that, check out this one of Leo. This will be in the description. Um, and also you will see the, let me go up a little bit. That little video of Russ that I have on here. Um, I don't know where it's at right now, but let's keep on going. And of course, every hypothesis has its own historical um, uh, description that it follows. It's already been presented very briefly. The uh, first hypothesis suggests a Germanic origin for the language, okay, some German dialect that became Yiddish. The other hypothesis suggests that um, Yiddish has been developed in the Khazarian Empire, relaxified during the time Jews did in Kiev and Rus, and finally uh, got its final form in the Slovian areas in Ukraine. Now, if you take 10 random linguists um, and, and put them in a room and ask them, um, if you follow the Rhineland hypothesis, go to this side of the room, and if you follow the believe in the other hypothesis, go to the other side of the room, maybe nine of them would go to the uh, first wall, and perhaps one would go to the uh, uh, other side of the room, and, and very likely because they misunderstood the question. So what he's actually saying there is actually the common um, problem that a lot of people who study truth, they run into. That's like one of the biggest things that everyone who seeks truth runs into. Um, and that's the wall of lies, right? The wall of lies. And when I say the wall of lies, they all are in agreement. They all are in agreement with a lie. Um, and what I mean by there is that though there's enough evidence, when I say enough evidence, historical, all types of levels of evidence, um, though there's enough evidence, a lot of people agree with a lot of the other scientists who don't believe in the science, yet say they do, um, agree with a lie. And what is that lie? It's a common quote. Like saying that they they came from this is what they believe in. Let me show you. I'm just gonna click this and see if it'll, it'll open. It's what he's basically pulling out um, and talking about. He's basically talking about how a lot of them believe the Rhineland idea. But I'm gonna show you how we we know that's not true. Um, one was what we just looked at. We looked at the males' lines, but we also can look at the females' lines. Now, what's also interesting about this? This is the idea that they believe. They believe that the Judeans were exiled to Rome in 70 A.D., which has no evidence at all. There's no historical evidence at all for the migration of uh, millions of Jews going into Rome or in that through Rome, even in the sense of it, and escaping um, prison or leaving prison. That's never, ever talked about, never talked about. Um, and that's talked about by different um, professionals that talk about there's no evidence of those things. And there's not. There's no evidence of those things. But what we also have to understand is that he's putting out this idea that rather they are actually going to be a group that actually converted. They actually a group that converted and actually moved. And this is actually what he's putting forth, that they actually the Turks and actually moved around and then they became the Ashkenaz. That's very important to understand is what he's saying there. So I should close this. So obviously this part where it says they are the people from uh, uh, 
the exiles of Babylon, they're not. They're, they're not the people from the exiles of Babylon. Um, because we can actually find out where the Jews are in there and learn their uh, Hablo group um, by real locations that they went and actually pinpointing these things. Um, but for getting the clarity on these things, here's an interesting summary of these things. Um, so it may be said that Asia was the cradle of the human race and that their and in their origin country, it was from thence those swarms came, right? Which filled Germany and the other Western and Northern countries. And here you must know that the Hebrews, at least the modern Jews, right? At least the modern Jews believe that the Germans owe their origin to him who in scripture is called Ashkenaz. So they're trying to say that the Germans are also Ashkenaz. Why? Because genetically con connected, but rather once you see the full picture, they're actually connected all in the North, right? When we talk about all the North, all of them are connected in the North. When I say connected as in a sense of, um, it was already illustrated a long time ago, pretty much is what, what it was illustrated. Let me go down and show you that on a map. So they're going to be, that's going to be descendants of Japheth, but you're going to have different branch of Japheth, right? You got your vein, you got uh, obviously Gog, I mean, we'll say Gomer, and then Magog, right? You got different lineages up here. So you can see Ashkenaz there. Ashkenaz, he's going to show you that Ashkenaz was actually in this area, right? And they actually end up moving over there, right? They end up somehow coming out, being in this area. And then something happened, Russ came and attacked them, right? You see that name right there? Russ, actually gonna push them this way and then they actually go this way, right? That's very important. And Russia is actually gonna be um, in a sense as all these groups connected to the Scythians. See this group right here, Scythian? So then connection to the Scythians. And all these are actually historical um, characters. A lot of these are actually his historical characters. You gotta know what names they get when they change, right? Mahdi, right? What happens with them and everything that's actually what a lot of the Japhatic lines are is Mahdi in connection to them but you can see right here this is mount Ararat. you're gonna have over here obviously africa and this is gonna be the middle east where you say you know israel and everything where you're gonna see a lot of the shemetic lineages there remember we see this illustration on the pre-pottery b when we look at the natufian design right we see this same de uh, design for the shemites right here um also in a little bit in these areas and we know that they went upwards some of the e-lineage but right here from this line right here, that's where you find a lot of the um, J's, your R's, your T's, a lot of Japhatic lineages that came down. Uh, it's very important to understand. That's that's pretty much the, the the clarity of the picture is that anything under CF, anything under CF, that's going to be a Japhatic lineage, right? Obviously, having the full picture of the illustration is actually very good, um, which is what this um, in, individual is doing, making a full picture of it all. So let's get a good understanding of this map. Let's just zoom in a little more. The reason why I want you to, to understand this map is because you see where it says Gomer, right? Gomer, anyone, anywhere you see Gomer, right? Gomer is some places in here. Gomer right there. They're going to be the same lineage. Magog, right? Connection with Gomer. Gomer and Magog, very connected. Gog and Magog, right? Gomer right here, this area, Ashkenaz, all these connected. These are all connected, right? To Garma. Right, you see what's going on there? Meggog right there, Gog and Meggog. See right there, Gog, Meggog. This actually, this is a map of pretty much illustrating, you know, where they are in the biblical narrative, right? The world at the world as known to the Hebrews, according to the Masonic um, account, right? Masonic account. So you can see what's going on over there. These different ones in these areas is gonna be more your Japhatic lineages up in the north, right? That's a good good way to understand what's going on um, just by seeing that. So that's going to be mapping. That's going to be an understanding and mapping. Go down a little bit. So now let's keep on going with what he's going to say here, because now he's going to get on some other information um, that's very important. So I just want to show you a little bit of what we had touched on. Now we're going to get on some other information on these things. But before I do, let's actually talk about the female lineage. The reason why I want to talk about the female lineage is because the female's line is, is we can actually find it ancient right next to where they stopped the Rhine River, right? The Rhine River, if you don't know about it, that's the area where, remember, they had migrated, right? Rush hit them and then took their capital and they merged with the rest of the, the people. They didn't, they didn't do a genocide. There's no recording of a genocide. That's important to understand. A lot of people, when they think that the Khazars were destroyed, they say that they just killed them all. 
but rather there was no genocide. They just wanted to stop them from collecting the money. So they killed the like the leaders and stuff like that. But then the peoples, they end up merging with the different groups in these areas. Now over here, there's going to be what you see France and Germany in the midst of them is, is basically the Rhine River, just to make that uh, short. Right here is basically a place, right? We're gonna look at this place. I'm gonna click it real fast. So this little place right here, we're actually gonna note some genetics in this area, right? We're gonna look at some, some genetics that we actually gonna find in this little area um, that's fairly interesting. So right here, so that's where it's at, right up there, right next to the Rhine, All right? Just get a little of the location, All right? And so that's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at genetics that we found here and ancient genetics. That's, that's what makes it um, very important that we're actually looking at ancient genetics, ancient, ancient, ancient genetics, right? So very interesting. On this part, let me actually go to something on this one down here. So here's the lineages that we find in the Ashkenaz when we think about the female line. Um, you probably already heard about it before when they say that they're actually European. Some try to say they're not European, but I'm going to show you today without a doubt that they're European. The reason why is because we have to have a perfect understanding that what is actually being brought forth is not because we are trying to cause division, but trying to bring unity and truth. That's what's very important um, in truth. So here's a, a report. I'm gonna read this report right here. It's a medical report from a medical site. I'm gonna read it, what it says right here. Four founding mothers who lived in Europe a thousand years ago were the ancestors of two fifths of all Ashkenazi. Um, obviously they found out more. They found out that pretty much all the mothers um, are from the upper areas. That's probably like, um, what they say? Like two, two, three percent. That's not, you see this H, J, T, and U5 and all that and whatnot and all these things, they're actually underneath um, N, underneath K, underneath K. Now, what I'm gonna show you here is where their, their genetics are found. So here's a little information. So both mtDNA, pretty much MYDNA tests were conducted on the skeletons. It's just talking about these skeletons that they found. I'm gonna open um, where this is from. A little bit of information here. I'm gonna go down a little bit. Right here, here's the cave. This this cave, basically, the genetics that they found there was from this cave right here, right next to the Rhine River. I'm gonna show you something here. Hold on, let me um, actually move real fast. Just a little much. Just got up really early. All right. So the reason why I wanted to show you this is because obviously, you know, we can see, you know, the males and whatnot, what they have, but we got to look at the females lines. You see what you're seeing there? T, U5, J, right? H, that's all that we see in the Ashkenaz, right? You can see H, you got H, you got your J, you got your T, you got U5. See what's going on there? And this is in ancient times. That's what makes this important is that during the time they wanted to make sure, you know, they say discovered about 3000 years ago were discovered. So all these individuals, right, dated to the Bronze Age about 3000 years ago. That's what makes it very important is that we're looking at ancient, ancient people so that we can see what's going on there. So obviously that's why they say it's from Europe, right? So that's what this is. A little information on that. But let's get back. Let's get back to the video and see what's going on there. Now let's get to the next part. Um, so um, that that's the state of um, acceptance of these two hypotheses. Uh, Rhineland has been adopted by uh, people who also believe Jews have Levantine origin, whereas the slavo irano turkish hypothesis, championed by uh, Paul Wexler. Um, professor in Tel Aviv University um, and, uh, and, and possibly a few others linguists um, who um, adopted this, this, uh, this hypothesis. Now, the main challenges uh, uh, for any hypothesis is to answer uh, the following three questions. What is the meaning of the name Ashkenaz? It, it's a long word. Um, it, it is not associated with any known uh, toponym, so place name. So how did it come about? How did Ashkenazic Jews become 
affiliated with that name, Ashkenaz. Uh, why did Yiddish appear in the ninth century? And how can we explain the large presence of uh, Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century? The rationale of our study uh, is as follows. Um, if we um, assume that the history of Yiddish mirrors the history of Yiddish speakers, uh, we should be able to uh, take uh, the DNA of Yiddish speakers, um, run it through the geographic population structure GPS algorithm that we developed in a previous um, uh, study. Uh, GPS converts DNA data into geography, uh, geographical regions, and uh, wherever GPS would predict those Yiddish speakers to, that would be the place where the um, Yiddish speakers' genomes has been uh, uh, finalized, um, received their genetic, final genetic touch, um, and that would also be the uh, birthplace of Yiddish. Um, that's that's um, easy, uh, easily said than done. Um, where would we find the DNA of Yiddish speakers? Um, solely Yiddish speakers, that's, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, or so I thought until I remembered that I designed the uh, database of the genographic project of the National Geographic. And when we designed this database, we um, um, allowed people to uh, um, annotate their genome and, um, and tell us where their parents are from and what language or languages they speak. Fortunately, by the time uh, the uh, Yiddish study took place, already um, over a quarter million public participants um, agreed to uh, participated in the genographic uh, project. They already submitted their DNA data. They filled the annotations. We have a very large database to at our disposal. Um, and, and remarkably, 4% of public participants were Jews. Um, most of them were Ashkenazi Jews. Um, that, that was a, a, a it's twice their population size, but uh, based on the number of inquiries I'm getting, I would guess they're like 60% of the participants are Jews, but uh, you know, 4% were good enough for us. Uh, we had 367 uh, Ashkenazic Jews um, who reported that both their parents were Ashkenazic Jews, and we were able to split them into two um, almost even groups. The first one, we call them solely Yiddish speakers. These are people who told us that both their parents speak only Yiddish. Uh, this was really great for us because um, um, that would suggest that if those parents speak only Yiddish, that's because their parents or the grandparents of the user um, would only speak Yiddish, right? And, and so on and so forth. So presumably that would be more homogeneous groups, whereas the, the other half of the Ashkenazi Jews, uh, their parents spoke um, um, multi, uh, multiple languages. Um, so we expected this group to be more heterogeneous. Um, so how does GPS work? Um, well, it starts with um, selecting ancestry informative markers. Uh, so these are a special group of genetic... So this part, I'm going to skip a little ahead. The reason why, because he just basically explains how it works and everything. And just, you know, how he can put them on a map and everything. I'm just going to get right to um, the meat of what he talks about. So he's just basically, you know, giving us idea and also know that what he's using is a tool that only goes back a thousand years. So obviously having the understanding of that, keep in mind that it's going to show where people are up to a thousand years ago, which is valuable in the sense, um, in this, in this sense, um, finding out where people are at the point of time. So here's, here's this right here. Now we can get an idea of it. I'm just skipping right here. Um, applying GPS to Ashkenazic Jews resulted in the um, in, in the following uh, figure. The Yiddish speakers are in uh, uh, orange triangles. Uh, we had some people who said they're Kohens and Levites. They're shown here, and then a bit of few mountain Jews and Iranian Jews are also on the map. Uh, and the results pointed to northeastern Turkey, a region of no particular significance in uh, in Jewish history. Um, not at all what was predicted by either theory. Uh, that's very baffling for us. Um, so we um, we uh, packed some uh, warm clothes and, and, and hiking shoes and, and food for several days, and, and we went to the nearby library, and we lived there until, um, until we found the following. 
uh, we found that this region um, harbored uh, primeval villages whose name uh, most likely derived from the word Ashkenaz. So we have Ishkenaz, Ashkenaz, um, Ashkenaz, and Ashkuz. Uh, the last one was um, evacuated in the mid seventh century AD. So what he found was maps of ancient villages. And he said that this one right here, the last one, Ascus, this was the last one that was evacuated about the 17th during that time early on. Now, what's also interesting about this little piece of information, now that we're talking about this, um, I haven't went over this before, so I'm gonna play some information here on one of these right here. I'm gonna go back to the one I don't know why I moved this from Pontus. The reason why is because notice where he's finding that genetics at right here, right? Right where we see Pontus. Now that's very important because Pont the origin of Pontus has to be known. Why does he find these here? What's the point? What's the reason for finding? And, and the people were saying that they're from here. They were saying, oh, my family's from here, but he was finding that they all came here, um, which other people also found these results to be the same. But let me show you something real fast with Pontus. So a little bit of knowledge on Pontus and why they landed there. The historians of antiquity considered Mithridates of Pontus one of the most ruthless adversaries the Roman Republic ever had. Rome and Pontus fought three wars, known as the Mithridatic Wars, in the first half of the first century BC. These conflicts not only killed hundreds of thousands, but also brought the end of Republican rule closer. In this video, we will describe the first of these wars. Asia became Roman client states. In 113 BC, Mithridates VI came to power. He was far more ambitious than his predecessors, and in the next 10 years took control of Colchis, won a war against the Scythians, and forced Bosporus to submit to his rule in exchange for- Now look at, look at what, this Pontus, what this leader did. You see how he looped like that? You see how he got all these areas? Now that's very important to note. I'm just gonna scroll through a little bit. I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is summarize the, the little bit little bit of movements they're making. You see right there, these are also, these are confederacies, right? These two, Thrace, all these, these are fairly, these are confederacies, what you're seeing there. A lot of them confederacies, connections, right? We even with the Armenians, got a lot of connections with these groups. Um, genetic connections, right? Different types of connections in those areas. I'm gonna go over a little bit. Obviously they lost this area to Rome, right? Rome actually defeated them and took this area and that was basically, you know, what happened to them is that they didn't keep this area for long. But you can see how they looped around like that. Along with 80 warships and two more wars against I'm gonna go over a little more, I'm gonna go to a different one. So just keep in mind, you know, as we look at these things that Pontus was at first, you know, thought to be a smaller area right here, but it actually took a lot of these areas, it actually took, started taking a lot of these areas. Um, a little bit here. You can see a little bit, they reappeared. So obviously this is just summaries and everything of it all, right? The my, This is the, the growth of them, a little bit of them. So you can see what's going on there, right? Growing, 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 just skipping a little ahead. You can see right there where they all reached that, right? All this area, you can see what's going on. Let's get a little understanding there. See how much of this is filled? See what's going on there? Just getting a little picture of it all before they shrink, before they start to shrink a little bit um, later on. So you can see right there, shrinking, shrinking. Very important. Not gonna, not gonna make a, a big history, history lesson on it. It's something that we should talk about. 20, 20 or 2002. Uh, on this one, go over here. Oh. These the second happened put to death for treason. 
Though Parthia had gained victory in the first war between them and Rome, conflicts between the two states would last for centuries to come. New video. Obviously, just a little meat, just giving a little meat here. The reason why is because you're going to see a little bit, of, a lot of talk about this piece of area right here. A lot of talk about this piece of area. A little more. This one is on this note um, right here. I'll actually show it once I show this. Go to four. You can see right here. In the food day's dream was the former Black Sea Empire. Here's the helpful map to trace its development. The dark purple in the center shows Pontus at the time of Mithridates' coronation. The purple around it shows his kingdom's expansion in the first two decades of his reign. This year saw the king revamp the Pontic military, recruiting a large army and organizing a strong navy with pirate allies. These forces were launched to bring his neighbors into the fold. Most impressive of the conquest would be the northern wars against the Scythian and Sarmatian tribes. These fierce steppe warriors were defeated along the coast and entered into an alliance with Mithridates. So that's also important to know, right? They subject a lot of the Scythians, a lot of Scythian groups were being subject to a lot of these groups. They weren't as strong as they were. Scythians used to be very strong, but after a while, they wasn't known as being strong. And to obviously, you see what's going on right here Rome pushing back, whatnot. These were dangerous years that shook the victorious broke away with the promises of But amazingly, there's even more to it. In closing, I'd like to write off just a couple more tidbits that I picked up in my research. He's reputed to have been an excellent horseman who won numerous chair races in games across the Aegean and in Anatolia. He fought personally in several battles. He was married to different queens and had yeah. was just, some, just some extra pieces of information. I guess the best way just to understand is that Pontus, long story short, had control of all these areas. And a lot of these people actually had, they was confederacies. A lot of them had confederacies with them. And they was actually very strong. This is also a very strong group. Um, not a lot of times talked about nowadays, not talked a lot about, but they are a strong people. In fact, I'm going to show you something. Um, some of Pontus areas were, was then con taken control by the Khazars. You see what's going on there? I'm going to show you something. This is a Jewish library. Let's talk about Russia, Rush and everything. Let's talk about some things and whatnot and what and what was going on. Remember, we talked about the Black Sea, right? Black Sea port and resort and whatnot. It says Jews settled there during the rule. Just talk about this person. We just talked a little bit about them and everything during the first century, right? They talk about the Jews settled there. Did they? No, absolutely not. The Jews didn't settle. There's no history to that. But it's just a quote that's on the Jewish library. Um, it says it came. The reason why is because the genetics are there. It came under the rule of the Khazar kingdom, right? You see what's going on there? And uh, sequence, obviously, under the Turks right after that, right? When the Russians, right, occupied that area and whatnot in the 1800s, pretty much they say no Jew was there. They say no Jew was living there when the Russians took it. So you, you'll, you'll note that, obviously, remember, we talked about the Russian Empire fell to, not the Russian Empire, the Khazar Empire fell to the Russians. Remember that. The Khazar Empire actually took over Pontus that was on the area of the Black Sea. So now that you understand that, now you know that the Khazars actually had some of the area of Pontus um, and all those areas that you've seen there. Just keep that in mind that that was a confederacy and that, that little map that I just showed you right here. There was a confederacy in this area. So you see what's going on. So then the Khazars had took these areas. And that's when you'll note when we look at the Khazars and their maps and everything, it's always important to know that Pontus is going to be connected um, with those things. Let me go to a, a better-ish map. Let me actually click one of these and go over. I could probably find one real fast. Only reason I want to show you that is because it's not talked about a lot, Pontus, because it was like real. It was that fast. But understanding it makes it important to know that that actually was an area that the Khazars end up taking, and they also was an area. Um, that is said that they say that the Jews went to and whatnot from after the exiles and whatnot, but that's not true. Actually, rather the people, if there was Jews there, during there's a historical record that re, historical report that reports that the people that was here when the Jews were here when Rome sacked Jerusalem, they took anyone who was left in any of these areas and moved them here. 
they either moved them down into Africa or they moved them into Spain. That's important to understand. Um, and that's that's historically recorded, but it's not recorded of the other day, which is the Jews settling there right after. Here's here's a picture right here, Khazaria. So Pontus was actually a piece of it. So you can know in Armenia. So these was actually in connection, obviously having a lot of these areas. So it was, when you see some of these maps, um, obviously keep in mind, uh, there's more confederations that were going on, right? That's different groups that's connected to the Khazars. That's different groups that's connected. And they have a lot of portion of this area. See the Black Sea and everything, Pontus, area of Pontus. Um, they actually have a, a large reach with a lot of these areas. There was a, a high trading area where basically like Tyra, just like the Tyra where they came from, because that's actually where they came from. When they came down, they, they actually settled in Tyra in, in the Phoenician area. But that's in ancient times. But today, today, that's just some information. There's the Gog Turks. So you see how much connection, 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 connection. Their names change, but they're the same people, same genetics, same people. Um, but I just wanted to show you that so you can see the connection with that piece of area. Let's keep going. Um, and, uh, and, and these are the first and only toponyms um, of the word Ashkenaz uh, known to us. And there are four of them, all of the, all in the same region. Um, and all of them are where Ashkenazi Jews were predicted to. And not only that, you can see that Ashkenazi Jews were predicted to have of trade routes um, that, that are found in this very uh, important region that borders the sea. Now the city, uh, the closest city that we have there is called Trebzon. Uh, and it was a port city that in ancient time had banks and, and bazaars and, and very strategic region to do trades with, with the northern region. So whoever uh, controlled the trade in this area uh, um, would be not only portable uh, because they had both access to sea and the land, but uh, also very successful merchants, um, which made sense to us because Ashkenazi Jews were merchants. Um, and from, from ancient time in, in the eighth century, they were Jewish and merchants were, were synonymous um, and traveling along the Silk Route um, or, or other trade routes moving between East and West uh, was something that has been, um, uh, Rabbi Novich already reported that uh, it's been known for a while. Now, uh, this is the same figure, except I added here the uh, circles that represent where the parents of the people who participated in the study were born. All right, so this is really interesting. You can actually see on one graph the females lines. Remember, we had looked at that when we'd seen that these females lines were actually known to be in these areas in ancient times, the H, the J, the T, right there, the T. And these are all under N, underneath K. So they're underneath N, underneath K. Um, so very interesting to see that, that the same um, lineages are found in these areas as well. And then you can see the E1B1B, and then obviously you have uh, different lineages and whatnot. E1B1B is that lineage, as you can see a large portion of it, large portion of E1B1B, that's the Shemitic lineage. That's the real Shemitic lineage, um, which is also interesting. E1B1 is actually known as said by this in individual that is said that E1B1 is actually the lineage of Israel. Obviously he also says T, but the reason why is T, we already looked at that, that T actually came back with E1B1B. So whenever you see E1B1B, you see T in different areas where E1B1B is. But the real lineage of Israel is E1B1A. But you can note here, you have different lineages in here, right? We already talked about each and every one of them, the J, Q, R. Um, I don't think we talked about G. We actually, we talked a little bit about G, that that's actually the area where the Turks is actually found here in the area of the Khazars. I mean, Khazar, in a sense, actually the uh, the Caucasian mountains. That's where you find the G. E, obviously, that's gonna be the real Shemitic lineage that they have. So let's let's keep on going with this though, because what you're seeing here is going to be one of those things that once you fully understand it, no one can take it away from you. Uh, uh, circles are proportional to the number of people. Now, what you see here is that none of the people who told us where their parents were born were predicted to those places, um, which is surprising because uh, this is not GPS being off. We already shown that GPS makes very accurate predictions for um, European non-Jews 
if those people were Europeans, they would be predicted to where the circles show us. What these results tell us is that this particular cohort of Ashkenazi Jews never mixed with the European people um, in, in, in the places where they arrived to. They always married other uh, their Ashkenazi Jews or other migrants from the same region. Um, now it's important to know not every one of them converted to Judaism, right? Some of them didn't convert, but they were always mixing with the same peoples, um, whether they converted or not. They didn't actually, when they moved, they didn't mix with people who were over here. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of ends and different things like that. When they say that they were mixing, you don't see a lot of certain ones, but rather they were mixing with a lot of subgroups that they were actually originally with. When, when a lot of this stuff happened, when Pontus fell, and the Khazars took over, and then Rush came and attacked the Khazars, and then the Khazars um, were absorbed into Rush, and then some of these areas, right? Some some went into Rush and went this way, and some went this way, right? That's what happened when actually when the, the area, which is called Khazar, right? Just a group of Turks and different groupings, as you see here. Um, when Rush fell, they joined Russia, or they joined uh, some of the groups this way, all the way up to the Rhine River, up to where France is. Now, it's actually very important to understand when you're looking at this, that obviously taking in the information that he's mainly talking about the area of Greek, I mean, not Greece, uh, Turkey, where you see Turkey at, um, or Anatolia, where you see right here, that was once owned by the Byzantine Empire, where they say Byzantine, which is actually the Roman Empire. Um, what's important to know, let me make sure I'm gonna write one right here. What's important to know is that that's why I wanted to show you all those things. So you can know a little bit of the history. Um, you're probably already familiar with it, but this is actually one of those things that's very important. So obviously this piece of information will be in the description, but let me go to something. I think there was one more piece I wanted to show here, a little bit up here. Besides that, um, I also notice sometimes, you know, with these things, they'll, they'll sometimes delete information. So I'll screenshot stuff. Um, so that we don't lose that information and everything. Here's a little bit on that area. Go down a little bit. This is just talking about um, a piece of land and area. I'm not gonna go over this right now, but let me go down, right? You think of Corinth, right? Corinthians and whatnot. You've probably seen that where it talks about Pontus and everything. Um, in Acts, after these things, Paul departed, right? from Athens and came to Corinth, right? And found a certain Jew right there, um, born in Pontus. Remember we had talked about that lately, come from Italy with his wife, Pris Priscilla. Why? Because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. See what I'm saying right there? That's why we know they didn't go into Rome. Very important to understand with, that, with those things. Go up a little bit. So that's important. It's also historically recorded that the Jews couldn't go into Rome. Here's a historical quote where it says, since the Jews constantly made, uh, obviously, disturbances at the, basically, whatnot in that area, um, he, Claudius, Cla even the same person, the book of Acts is historically accurate, he, Claudius, expelled them from Rome, right? You see what's going on there? It talks about the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. That's why they couldn't go into Rome. That's why it's a false, um, it's a false history when they say that the Jews went into Rome because Claudius had a decree that they couldn't go into Rome. Um, so just some extra information there uh, when it was in Pontus. So that was like a little area um, that was even mentioned in the time of Acts, right? Pontus, and that was an area that was not considered Rome. They counted Pontus not an area that was Roman area, but an area outside of Rome. So I just want to show you a little bit of that, and that they couldn't go into Rome. The Jews couldn't go into Rome after 70 AD. That was very important. Only except for um, one of them, or very few, if it was others which we only record that we see Flavius Josephus. And obviously he was gonna die and the whole story about that is it has to be known in its exact understanding, which is because he made a prophecy. But let's keep on going. Um, and they preserved their Turkish-like genetic signature. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking, I, I'm saying Turkish here just for simplicity. Of course, by that time, there were no Turks, not, not in those regions. I mean, this is clear, right? I mean, all, all people's names should be taken to an, uh, in, in this simple manner, not in the necessarily historical one. Um, and, and then we have one um, ancient Scythian there, and that's the, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the square, it's, uh, it's ancient Scythian. Um, 
looking at the haplogroups, both maternal and paternals, uh, they're very heterogeneous. So um, you can forget all about the uh, single ancestor um, hypothesis that a lot of people preach. I mean, it's, you can see it's not in the cards. Um, what is uh, more interesting than this hypothesis is that the um, Yiddish, solely Yiddish speakers show diff slightly different trends from the, uh, the multilingual Ashkenazi Jews, as in they retained um, haplogroups of uh, East Asian origin. So in the Y group, that would be the Q1b. In the mitochondria, that would be uh, such haplogroups such as P2. So these are East Asian origins, and they were lost in the multilingual Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, presumably because um, just the strafe over time uh, made them disappear. Okay, so as we suspect that the solely Yiddish speakers um, were more homogeneous groups and were able to preserve more, more ancient signatures. Um, so, but how do we know that uh, Yiddish did not place Ashkenazi Jews in, in Turkey because they're half Levantines and half Russians, for example? Um, so to answer this question, we did some simulation. So we used a model that you see on, on the left half part. That's, that's the model. That's a distribution of the gene pools um, in, in Eurasia. From this model, we can generate individuals that would be native to, to every region uh, according to the model. Okay, so we generated some, we call them Khazarian, Kafkazian, we generate some Ashkenazic Turks. So from the model, we generate people that would be native to those regions. And you can see in C, the places that we selected um, uh, to generate those, uh, those um, archaic individuals. Um, in D, you can see where GPS predicted them too. Um, so um, if you're from, um, so, so the uh, um, simulated Levantines were all predicted to the Levant, but the simulated Iranians, only half of them, uh, le less than half, were predicted to Iran, and uh, some were predicted to Turkey, and some were predicted elsewhere. Why? Because the Iranians were very, very heterogeneous, and this entire region does not have very good, uh, strong geographic signature. Uh, related to genetics. So Iranians are a bit all over the place. Why is that important? Because that would um, tell us just how reliable those findings are. Um, in uh, pink, in, in D, you can see that the Ashkenazic Jews were all predicted to, uh, to Turkey. Okay. Um, now in E, what you see is the genetic similarity between Ashkenazic Jews and, and everyone else. So Ashkenazic Jews are uh, uh, quite homogeneous. You see the genetic distance within the group is close to zero, but the next population they're closest to are the Khazarian Kafkazians, which is not surprising because if you look at C, there is a bit of overlap. Some of those Khazars are, uh, were sampled from Turkey. These are the boundaries of, used to be the boundaries of, of the empire, um, and followed by high genetic similarity, the Ashkenazi Turks, which are predicted very well to Turkey from the model. In other words, if Ashkenazi Jews were half Levantines and half uh, Russians, they would not show high similarity to these populations. Okay, so from those results, um, we we know that the Ashkenazi Jews were predicted to Turkey because they look very much like model native, uh, 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 you know, ancient Turks, um, uh, rather than a mixture of two uh, or more different populations. Um, in F. So what he is also saying here is the same thing that many other geneticists and almost anyone who looks at the information finds that the Ashkenazi are actually Turks. That's actually what he's saying here. And we, we showed that before there's multiple videos we have on the Synthetic Sunday where we show that the Ashkenazi are actually Turkish. That's very important. And a mix, a mingled group with majority of the Turkish lineage. But let's keep on continuing on. You can see the proportion um, of uh, different clusters within our database and their similarity to uh, um, to uh, all these simulated individuals. So most of the Ashkenazi Jews show high similarity to the um, uh, Khazarian Kafkazians, um, and, and the trees look like um, uh, looks like the, uh, the Turkish northeastern Kafkazians. Uh, what does it all tell us? 
Uh, well, uh, we um, remind you our goal was to address the question of origin of Ashkenazi Jews and their language, uh, which have been uh, some of the most debated language uh, questions in genetics history and, uh, and, and linguistics of, uh, over the past 300 years. Genetics, of course, a little bit less. Um, and just a reminder, the main challenges for any hypothesis was to are to explain the meaning of the word uh, Ashkenaz, um, the appearance of Yiddish in the 9th century, and the large presence of um, Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century. Um, Ashkenaz is mentioned in the Bible in, in three contexts, twice uh, in the context of uh, Noah's grandson, and, and the third one as the prophecy that Jeremiah uh, provides, uh, whereas one day the three kingdoms, um, Ashkenaz, Minai, and uh, and and Aratru, uh, would uh, uh, Ararat, sorry, Uratru, um, would wage war on on Babylon. They didn't really like the Babylonians for obvious reasons, uh, but that kind of gives us a sense of where Ashkenaz can be, uh, um, and, and it's not in Germany, because they uh, it, it would not make any sense. Um, it should be somewhere in this region. Um, Ashkenaz. Um, is the uh, uh, in in Akkadian is Ashkuz or Ishkuza and and it refers to the people that who the Greek called the Scythians um, and and this is their location um, in in the orange part Babylon resided in in Parthia and and south um, so so you can see why this prophecy makes sense geographically our predictions uh, were a bit. Uh, um, you know, in northeastern Turkey, so just the edge of the uh, Scythian Empire, but this entire region was called um, Ashkenaz, and presumably these these names uh, over time was was lost. Um, there is um, there is I don't need to tell you there is a process of changing certain names to other names to support um, uh, the. the the, the, the ambitious of whoever lives there in, in Israel, uh, it's being done all the time and possibly in Turkey as well. So he's now he's talking about what we had talked about before too, where they were changing the names and we were talking about that, how they were passing them by a law. We had talked about how they were named, changing their names and everything. I don't know where does that on here, but we had noted that, that there was laws that were passed to change their name. Right, that's very important. That when you change someone's name, it makes it a little hard to find their origin. Right, it's very, very, very hard to find origins of people um, when names are changed. Um, for example, let's see if I can find that. Let's see. I'm not sure exactly where. Let me see. Right here, this here, here it is. I don't mean to go up there, but I'm gonna go back to that one that I believe is right up here, right? I don't know why. Let's try to find it one more time. I've just seen it, but change. Uh, I'll let it be because this one, this one we had talked about before already. We just talked about that law. If you've never seen it, pretty much, there's a law that actually changes their names. That was actually a law that was passing. That was they was changing their names. I'm just seeing here if I see it real fast and whatnot. Just looking, just looking real fast. Right. If you never seen that, pretty much, you know, it's one of those things it's not hard to find. They were they were they passed the law to change their name, pretty much. I'm gonna try one more time. Let's see if I can see it. I gotta think about how it was word. Let's see. Right here, here it is. A little bit on it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go too much in depth on it, but you can find it yourself, right? It's gonna be in the in the in the link. Just talks about the Israeli names law, right? Just talks about everything. A little bit about it. What now? 
you can see the names law adopted by the Israeli, uh, what's that? Nexit. I don't know if I'm going to say that right. Kezit. In night, it just talks about that time, right? A little bit after it, um, the founding of the buying of Israel by the Rothschilds, right? They had bought Israel, right? July, obviously a little earlier, right? Um, 1948. But right here is 1956 established that the Israeli that Israeli citizens must bear a first and last name, family name. It just talks about the adoption of Hebrew names was a key st strand, right, in the Zionism ide ideology, right? Just long story short is that they were passing the law when not is recorded after they had got the land in 1948, um, and what happened? They start changing the names and what and whatnot. Just to show you a little bit of that, that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about how. Their names changed. There was a law that was passed. Um, so names disappearing, ancient names disappearing. So we're for very fortunate to recover these ones, uh, thanks to our um, GPS telling us where to look for. Um, um, so, um, so how did Ashkenazi um, uh, became uh, affiliated with this name? So this question is not clear, but. Um, we already know that this name has been called Ashkenaz for a very long time, and we know that Jews uh, were uh, traitors. Uh, by the first century, most of the Jews in the world resided in the Iranian Empire. Um, they were descendants from Judean uh, emigrants, or most likely from local converts to Judaism that were extremely active in international trade. Um, over time, many of them moved north to the Khazarian Empire to expand their uh, uh, commercial operations. Uh, later on, they influenced uh, the religion reform in the Khazarian Empire, where the Khazarian Empire is converted to Judaism. There is no doubt about that. Um, consequently, not only the Turkish rulers converted to Judaism, but a lot of other uh, Eastern Slavs and, and other members of the empire, of the elite, converted to Judaism so they can participate in the very profitable uh, trade between uh, between uh, Europe and, and China. Uh, that was a Jewish monopoly. Um, and we speculate that Yiddish emerged at that time as a secret language to give Jews advantage in trade. Um, and it was based on Slavic and Iranian patterns. Now, anyone who speaks foreign language and, and shops in, 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 in uh, stores that were, uh, there is another prevalent language sp spoken, can understand the advantages we're talking about. I mean, you can um, you can manipulate prices. You can ask the guy, uh, you know, your worker, how much does it cost, and then set the person twice that price. Um, and uh, you either suffered or benefited from this phenomenon. But, but hopefully, you know what I mean. Um, but this this raises the questions. Provided Ashkenazi Jews are named after Scythians, the question is, are they Scythians? Uh, we believe that the answer is no. Um, Although in this study we did not use ancient DNA from Scythian, it is available now, so that question will need to be revisited. But for the time being, um, we believe that the answer is no, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, um, um, we, we are not certain about the exact ancestry uh, uh, of the ancestors of uh, Ashkenazi Jews. So obviously, this was actually earlier on. Now, what's interesting about this is that this study. When you're looking at the who are the Scythians, obviously we have ancient Scythian DNA. We have ancient Scythian DNA is something we had got over time. Um, it's definitely a, a game changer, right? When we look at that, the Scythian DNA, right? We is is exactly their gen, the Scythian DNA. The Scythian DNA is exactly the same DNA of the Philistines, of the Philistines that came into the area, the Scythians and the Philistines. Are the same people, the the Scythians and the Philistines became the same people. I'm gonna click something and just go over, let it load a little bit. Let's let it load in, and then I'm gonna go over. Just gonna go to that report on those things to see where exactly at. That's just over here, right? And and the, the the exact lineage of the C peoples is R1BM269, and then you will see that R1BM269 was actually the one that they found 
um, and the Sea Peoples, and the Sea Peoples, and and the uh, Scythians. Let's see if it's right here. Oh no! Just go over a little bit right here. Here it is. This talks about the leaders of the Scythians that were found underneath those coggins or the, the, the domes and whatnot that they had, kind of like the little pyramid type style. They had R1B, right? R1B M269. That's very important. R1B M269 was in the Scythians. That's also found in obviously the ones in the land that has settled in the Levant, who was actually the Sea Peoples who came from the north. So very, very interesting to see both of those things connected in ancient genetics. Let's go back over here. So obviously both of those things are in the Ashkenaz. We had talked about that before. Both of those genetics are gonna be in them. Um, R1B and R1A, both of those. Go up a little bit. And remember these are different fathers. So RM269, how much? 15%, very, very large portion in them. said before it's a bit difficult without ancient dna and it's only uh, just now uh, being published um nonetheless the term ashkenazi is already a very large clue as to the iranian origin of the group that inhabited the central eurasian steppes um at that time there were also uh, greeks there and slavs so it's quite a quite a hub of, of people of irano greco roman slavic um, origin um but uh, so so why did they call themselves Scythians? Well, um, there um, at, at that time, um, Scythians um, uh, were not there anymore, uh, but but their memories remained. Uh, their language was not speak uh, spoken at that time; it, it disappeared, but um, the, the the name remained, and um, and and the annotation of of the Bible gave it a very. Uh, uh, a certain glory, uh, not to mention the Scythians were very um, uh, uh, fearsome uh, warriors. Uh, the Greeks were absolutely fascinated with them, the story of the Amazon and so forth. And, and you always call yourselves after, after a higher and, and stronger culture. That's why uh, the Judeans call themselves Israelites, because this was a two different kingdoms, right? And, and Israel was gone. The, 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 they were exiles, the 10 tribes were exiled and the, the remaining sort of lost their identity. The Judeans uh, adopted uh, uh, those, uh, those those people who remained and their Israelite identity. And we called ourselves Israelites, um, even though we're not really considered ourselves related to the large, that large collective, but rather to the, uh, the Judean tribe. Um, likewise, um, these people in uh, ancient Ashkenaz lands, um, they lived in a region that was called Ashkenaz. They had the villages whose names derived from Ashkenaz, um, and there were those um, very cool people who, who were called also um, Ashkuza. Um, so they adopted the name at least for 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 a while, um, and and potentially they also saw themselves sharing ancestry with those with those people. Now, what happened to that name, to this identity, Ashkenaz identity, after they left? Uh, that's 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 a very fascinating question. Um, so, why, uh, when, and why was Yiddish invented? So, um, again, um, because there were so many Jewish communities along major trade routes um, who share religion, common culture, and history. Um, they developed Yiddish as a secret language so they can maintain their political and spiritual unity um, and, and gain uh, advantage in trade. This uh, conclusion is supported by two uh, form of evidence. The first one is linguistic. There are 250 words of buying and selling in Yiddish. So this is the language of traders. And, and you can see just how many there is in English. Uh, the second one is the genetic evidence. You can see the genome of Ashkenaz Jews is being mapped to this hub of trade routes um, in in the region that we called ancient Ashkenaz. Okay. Now the reason they needed um, Yiddish and could not use Hebrew is because nobody could speak Hebrew at that time. They could pray, but it was not a spoken language, so it wasn't good. Um, so how do we explain the large presence of Jews in Eastern Europe in the 19th century? Well, um, at some point, uh, 11 to uh, century to, to the 13th century, Khazaria lost its prominence 
and the dish when also given the seal codes um, ended. Uh, this process um, was, was uh, stimulated by, by several factors, invasion of the Ross, uh, the Black Death brought by rats from uh, Asia to Europe and, and the Mongolian invasion. Um, just it was a little bit too much to ask uh, the Khazars to, to uh, maintain uh, uh, themselves throughout all those disasters and the empire uh, fell apart. Jews moved west uh, to Ukrainian lands, and from there they moved to uh, Germany, where German traders, where the uh, Jewish traders already established some kind of uh, towns. Um, the relaxification process of the language was, was abandoned. Um, Yiddish, uh, Slavic Yiddish. There were other Yiddish languages uh, that went extinct in different parts of the world. Slavic Yiddish is the only one that survived. It's called today just Yiddish. Um, and it became the first and only spoken and written language um, and start absorbing more and more German words on its Slavic grammar, which is why um, people call it uh, uh, um, jargon or broken German. Um, so, so, so again, why, why Ashkenazic Jews? Where, if, if Jews moved out of Ashkenaz, um, why haven't we heard about that term for uh, um, early on, and if it was, could it have been that it was forgotten, but um, but but some memory remained. Um, so these are all fascinating questions, um, but and, and of course there is a lot of uh, confusion involving it. Uh, um, the, and, and some people believe that the only real Ashkenazic Jews are Germans, and other non-German Jews are should not be called Ashkenaz. Um, our findings um, suggest otherwise. Um, a lot of the confusion uh, concerning this hypothesis stems from the erroneous association of the term Ashkenaz with German, uh, Germans or German lands in the 11th century. Um, the, the, from historical perspective, the, the word Ashkenaz starts with a stifum in the, uh, um, and, and that term remained in the region. It was not, the, the, the Germanic association was made only very later on. Um, already in, uh, in the 10th century in Baghdad, it meant Slavic. Um, so the meaning of the word changed a little bit. And only in the 11th century, it was, uh, it, it got the word of German um, Yiddish speakers um, and so forth. However, already in the 10th century, Moroccan Kuwait philologists knew that Ashkenaz Jews descend from the Khazars and, uh, and Germans. Um, meaning that they came from uh, Khazar Empire and spoke um, Yiddish. Um, so, so you can understand this this confusion, um, and and a lot of um, there are several other authors who recognize Ashkenaz as uh, as as the regions of the Near East. Uh, Kap some Caucasus Jews uh, are still known by um, Ashkenazic by their neighbors. This is not because they adopted the name from German Jews. They were the first Ashkenazic Jews, um, which also means that those um, Turkish Jews, again, those people from that region in northeastern Turkey who arrived in Khazaria and later on moved to Russia um, and are the ancestors, most likely, of modern day Russians, should also be <laughs> uh, properly called Ashkenazic Jews. So what he's saying here is what we just looked at. He's saying that the Russians, right? We just looked at the Russian um, DNA from Rus. The Russians, a lot of the Germans, a lot of the people in that area are highly related. That's what he's actually saying. He's saying that they're, they they should probably call themselves Ashkenaz as well because they're actually the same people is what he's saying. He's saying that they didn't go nowhere and call themselves Ashkenaz after a people because they try to say that they, they try to make the Germans Ashkenaz. But really... The Germans, uh, they're going to be obviously the barbarians that have moved that er to that area. But the Ashkenaz, they are the Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz are Ashkenaz, right? The ones who they call the Jewish, they are actually the original Ashkenazis, right? That's very important. That's what he's actually saying there is that pound by pound, looking at the genetics and looking at um, who they are, that they are actually the Ashkenazis. Long story short, is what he's actually illustrated there is that they are the Ashkenaz. They are the Khazars. They are the, actually the Khazars. A little bit of history on the Khazars. Let's play a little history real fast. Since this is the day we touched on the Khazars a little bit. 
I'm just gonna go a little up some. So history with Sai, if you've never seen this, he goes over the Khazars and everything about them and, and a couple different things and whatnot. Uh, if you're not familiar with the history of the Khazars, it's really interesting. Um, I'm gonna play a little bit of it. So here's the area of the Khazars. They say they may be over here, but they actually are over here being part of the broken branch of the Gog Turks and everything. See the Khazars right there? And remember, I showed you how they took Pontus. Remember, Pontus had all this. So the Khazars had all this as well, all that Pontus had. Some to the north. But remember, Rome was very powerful, but the Khazars being what you see with Rome, in fact, I'm going to let it play. By the other great power in the region, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. However, instead of facing them, others were simply content to live under Khazar rule. Of course, these expansions didn't go unnoticed by the other great power in the region, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. However, instead of facing them in battle, early Byzantine emperors chose instead the path of diplomacy and flattery, offering valuable gifts and even their daughters as wives to Khazar rulers. Such alliances proved... Did you hear what he just said there? He just said that the Khazars and the Romans were giving each other wives and they were marrying each other. The Khazars and the Romans united. The Khazars and the Romans had united. That's very important to understand. So you can see he just talked about that. Let's go. That's when the Let's go back over here. Uh, it is, uh, this is not uh, the German Jews who hold uh, a title to that term. Um, so, uh, of course, some people do not agree. Uh, Truth suggested in her response to our paper that Jewish immigrants in Europe uh, just transferred biblical names at random into regions where they settled. Um, this is uh, a ridiculous proposal. Um, for several reasons. First of all, uh, biblical names, uh, there, there was not randomness involved in the process of, of uh, transferring biblical names into certain regions. Um, the, it, it would only make sense if the two names have similar sounds. Uh, Germany and Ashkenaz do not sound the same, and Germany was already known as Germana uh, or Germania in, Iranian, in the Iranian Talmud. Uh, it was associated with Noah's other grandson, uh, Gomer. Uh, uh, so um, so uh, name adoption, uh, for name adoption to occur, the two names need to have kind of similar uh, sounds, like Sephard and Spain. Uh, this is not the case here. Ashkenaz has very clear geographical affinity that no one doubts that it's in the Near East. Um, and, um, and, 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 and that explanation that Aptrud's proposed uh, is simply not necessary. Uh, Germany was also known by French scholars, uh, Jewish French scholars like the Radak as Almania, um, okay, after the Almani tribes. Um, and that name was also adopted by Arab scholars. Um, so the questionable interpretation of Rashi as Ashkenaz um, that is often being made here to sustain the, uh, the association of Ashkenaz with Germany is simply incorrect. Radak uh, came after Rashi, he, he used his language, uh, his symbols, so obviously he could read what Rashi wrote and he would not make that mistake as in uh, ignoring what Rashi called Germany, supposedly Ashkenaz, and call it Almani instead. So um, this association associated with, with Rashi is simply incorrect. Rashi did not mean Ash Germany when he used the word Ashkenaz. Um, Yiddish is uh, a Slavic language. Uh, Paul Wexler's um, excellent book in, in our uh, study brings several uh, uh, cultural evidence to support this. Uh, two of them. So this part is, is very great because what he does is show the connection with the Yiddish and Slavic origin of some of the traditions that are still going on in some of the communities. I always talk about this, that a lot of the Ashkenazi uh, practices, beware them because they're not actually the ancient Israelites, nor do they have the ancient Israelite practices, that a lot of their practices are actually going to be uh, very hedonistic, uh, such as these ones. Them, known ones are breaking glass in a wedding ceremony and placing stones on graves. Um, surely you've seen it if you're Jews or if you haven't Jews, you didn't understand why there are rocks on graves, but that's a Slavic Jewish practice. Uh, breaking a stone, of course, is very well um, known today as Jewish practice of Slavic origin. 
Um, now, I, I uh, don't know how it is done in Slavic lands, but uh, in, in Israel, they're not using glass. They're using some, some very, very thin form of, of, of glass. And you can see it should be wrapped in, uh, in, in some kind of napkin. Um, because, uh, and every year there is this guy who, uh, you know, buy those cheap shoes and ends up in the hospital because, or, or use real glass because they forgot that, you know, special uh, glass. Uh, <laughs> and so, so it's kind of a risky practice. Uh, don't try it, um, don't try it at home. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are, uh, Yiddish practices. Um, so, so how do those results, um, in, re uh, in respect to the remaining literature? Well, oddly enough, um, they're in general agreement with uh, the findings of other studies, of course, not necessarily their conclusions. Uh, there is a very well-known bias in the field where um, uh, people feel that it is necessary to uh, uh, show that um, Ashkenazic Jews are from uh, the Levant for obvious reasons. It has nothing to do with science. Um, but um, they were never able to show that convincingly, or else there wouldn't be so many studies trying to do so. The vast majority of genetic studies found that Ashkenazi Jews are very similar to um, either Near Eastern uh, populations or South European populations, rich Italians, but but never to uh, Bedouins and Palestinians. If you take in account other populations, of course, if you only test Bedouins and Palestinian and and English, you would found that Jews are closer to the Levantine one than to the English one. But and and that's one way to bias these kind of studies. But if you use a wide array of populations, the, 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 the first ones will come up uh, more similar than the Levantine ones. Um, of course, uh, with, with very few exceptions, such findings uh, of Near Eastern and South Europeans are being interpreted uh, or should have been misinterpreted in favor of Middle Eastern Judean ancestry, um, although the results do not support that. Um, then there are several ways of conjuring uh, Middle Eastern origin, despite of the findings, um, and I'll, uh, our paper is discussed them at, uh, at length here, just very briefly. Um, whatever uh, one way is that whatever you find, uh, let's say you find Southern Europe, such as Stelden and colleagues found, so that would be the Europeans one, right? Then you'd say, oh yes, it's consistent with the Mid Mediterranean origin because you know uh, South Europe borders the Mediterranean, hence. The connection to the Middle East, hence Jews are from the Middle East, which is anyone who would read the study understands as the Levant. The, the Middle East is a very large region, harbors the Levant. The Levant would just be Israel, maybe bits of Lebanon and Turkey. That would be the Levant. But when someone study says we found Jews from the Middle East, the, the, the connection they want you to make in your head is that they mapped it to Israel, which is not the case. Uh, So what he's doing here is actually giving you a warning. He's actually warning you that there's a lot of liars out that will actually try to say that when, when he's actually um, saying that the genetics point to the Levant, they're actually pointing to areas that you have to look at with the sermon is what he's saying. And a lot of times when they say Levant, they want you to have a connection with Israel, right? Pinpoint in the location where Israel was, but that's not the case. Um, in fact, we have multiple studies that tell you the J, the R, and certain um, Hablo groups are not found in the areas where Israelites were known to be in. Um, but they're going to be found in areas where a lot of sea peoples were, like Sidon and Tyre and things like that, and the Philistines and things in those in those areas. It's important to understand what he's also making sure is understood with the results that he's pulling up here, that they're landing in the land of Turkey. Right. That's where the people are actually landing at. They land in the land of Turkey. But he's also taking note that there's other people who will take the information and give a, a almost like a blurred gray line where they'll, they'll basically say something and expect you yourself in your own mind to come with the answer is what he's saying here. But he's rather he's saying he's giving the direct answer and some people give the blurred line so that a lot of people come to a conclusion and say, oh, they must be Israel because they're from the Levant. But he's, he's letting us know that actually a lot of people are actually from the Levant. When I say from the Levant, being known to be in, around that area is what he's saying there. He's actually letting us know to be careful, to tread these things carefully. So the way that we actually have the clear picture is the process of elimination is what he's, he's talking about as well, is that 
if they're connected to anyone else in any sense as in being of these land, because remember, Israel, what's special about Israel is that Israel also genetically, they should have only one father, one father, and they should all be of the same and they should be uh, under one line that no one else have. Because we're talking Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? A very um, distinct line that should be not connected to anyone uh, as in up the north. The reason why is because when we look at the line of Israel, they actually went southward. They actually went to Africa. Um, and then they were called out of Egypt, right? And then they land in the Levant. Is what he's saying there. It's very important. So he's letting us know if they have connection to someone up the north and we know we can follow their line and they also match there, that's when you got to uh, look at the information a little more careful. That's why we showed you J and the R. And obviously, you can look at each and every one of those lineages to see where they were in ancient times. That's how we can find out if they're Israel. So, so I went back a little bit so you can hear what he just said again. Study says this found due to the Middle East. The, the, the connection they want you to create the study understands as the Levant. The, the Middle East is a very large region, harbors the Levant. The Levant would just be Israel, maybe bits of Lebanon and Turkey. That would be the Levant. But when somebody studies says this found due to the Middle East, the, the, the connection they want you to make in your head is that we're not with Israel, which is not the case. Um, another way of uh, reporting the results, like we see at LD, they declared that uh, it is part of the Near East. Um, so they, they map Jews to the Caucasus region, which they call the Near East, and, and instead of calling it Middle East, now it's the Near East, and, and apparently the Levant is part of the Middle East now of the Near East, uh, and also the Ashkenazi Levite that they tested. Um, very common policy um, to uh, th that is made is saying that Ashkenazi Jews are very, very similar to one another, hence they have a Middle Eastern origin. Uh, so Koppelman and colleagues did that, uh, for example, and um, I, hopefully you understand that one does not entail the other. Genetic similarity within a cohort does not is not automatically uh, linked to the Levant. I mean, Chinese are more similar to each other than other populations, but they're not from the Levant. So one does not uh, um, allow you to deduce the other one. Um, but, but you can see um, how they're saying it. They're saying that because they share genetic similarity, um, they, they, it means that they also share a common Middle Eastern ancestry, although this has never been shown in their study. Um, and um, Pian and colleague dismissed uh, very similar findings. Again, the Ashkenazi Jews are similar to one another um, and similar to uh, a Caucasus population. So it should have been, the conclusion should have been that they share common ancestry with the Caucasus, uh, but Pian et al. decided that uh, Jews are uh, aliens and that uh, in their case, <laughs> the results do not mean that they have a, a non levantine geographical origin. Um, and what is very, very common to do is to, um, is to make the argument that you found similarity with non-Jews uh, that are not in the Levant because those people in the past were Jews. And that kind of argument uh, is, is the same one that is being made in religion. It cannot be refuted. If you decide that any similarity you find is because Jews and non-Jews, it is because the non-Jews were actually Jews. Um, there is no way to test it, but also no way to refute that. Uh so what he's doing is revealing us their tactics. What their tactics is this. I'm going to show you what he's basically explaining here. This is what he's explaining here. Since every one of these Hablo groups is found in the Ashkenazi, let's say if there was another individual that was an R lineage, yeah, he wasn't an Ashkenazi, and he knew he wasn't an Ashkenazi, because he has the same lineage, they'll say, oh, you, you're a secret Jew. You don't. You didn't even know you was a Jew, but you're a Jew. If they have a, a E one B one B M thirty five or M thirty four, they'll say, "Oh, you are a secret Jew." A J lineage, oh, you're a secret Jew. G lineage, oh, you're a secret Jew. Q lineage, oh, you're a secret Jew. You see what I'm saying here? But if you if you're you're not on that, if you're if you're the real Jews, if you're E one B one A, you're not a Jew. You can't be a Jew because you're not connected to the Rhine land. You're not connected to these lineages. See what I'm saying here? That's what he's that's what he's actually saying. He's he's saying that the fallacy is that they're using these lineages to this to, to determine what is an ancient Jew. But these are not the ancient Jews, is what he's saying there. 
and by comparing any individual to the modern Jews, and he talks about this in one of his um, writings that's really interesting. Um, in fact, let me open that up. He actually puts, he actually does a, a update. One of the brothers was talking about it on the update of one of his uh, illustrations that he was making. I'm actually going to go down to that, which is right here, right? It was uploaded on um, Ancient Origins, and it just talks a little bit of some things that I think is very interesting. Let's talk about it. He talks about how obviously they can't open up the ancient tomb in Hebron of Abraham, but Let's look. They actually still found Israelites. Is what he he's actually talking about that in the land of the Levant they found ancient Israelites, and this is what they found. This is the same person, the same individual, right? The Valley of Dry Bones, right? Aaron El Hak. Let's see what he says right here. He says this. He says this is the only match from prehistory times to date, but it is reasonable because he got the ancient genetics of um, actual Israelites. Uh, it is reasonable to expect many more to come and ancient DNA from Eastern Europe and whatnot. And a coccyx will be sequenced, right? Interestingly, the Y chromosome haplotypes of the ancient Israelites were typically E1B1, right? Because E1B1 creates E1B1B and E1B1A. So he's saying those are going to be most likely the Israelites. The reason why is because E1B, the E lineage is actually native to the Levant. This is a geneticist who's telling us these things unbiasedly, right? He has no bias, but he also found the T1 lineage. That's important to understand. So he actually has to make a choice. Is it E or is it T? The T lineage came with E1B1B. We already talked about that, how when E1B1B went up, it actually is recorded that when he came back, there was a T lineage and an H lineage that came with him. Um, commonly found today in Africa with lower frequencies in the Middle East and Europe, right? T lineage, obviously, like we said, everywhere you see E1B1B, you usually see T. You usually see T around there. Go down a little bit. It says, we can expect that future tests, obviously cover these regions and everything and talk about the portions of the Jews and whatnot, genetic Jewishness. Now watch what he says. Only time will, will say if genetic Jewishness will evolve, right? Because he wants it to change, not just testing people today, but testing ancient peoples, right? As it should be in genetics to compare peoples today to ancient people to see if they're the same peoples, right? Will evolve into... That's what he's pretty much saying. It's, long story short, is what he's saying: he's saying genetic Jewishness should determine a someone who's actually Israeli. He says where people define their Jewishness based on their similarity to ancient Israelites. So remember, the E lineage that he found there was actually from ancient Israelites, right? The E1B1, the E1B1. We can already talk about the T. I already told you how the T is actually connected with E1B1. B because they came down. That's why T is connected there because everywhere you see B, E1B1B is where you see T. Now let's, let's, let's keep on going. So he says ancient, similar to ancient Israelites. That's what we talked about when we talked about the Natufian because the, the understand he knows the truth. He knows that the Natufian DNA is, is, is grossly, um, grossly, grossly miscalculated. When I say miscalculated, the, the years of the E1B1 and, and all those things and all that is, is highly too ancient. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, it's clearly too ancient. They're, they're putting the years all weird because they don't want no one to know that they're Israel. That's the real truth. I got plenty of quotes that will tell you that the E lineage is actually found there during the time of the kings. Plenty of quotes. So that's what he's saying here. He's saying that people should be compared to ancient Israelites and Jews rather than modern ones, rather than modern ones. That's what that's what Aaron um, at L. Hike is saying right there. He says, think about it next time that your favorite genetic testing company tells you that you have some Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. See what's going on there? Because he knows that the ancient genetics of ancient Israelites is actually E1B1. But remember how we already talked about what, what about T? Why is he saying T, right? The reason why is because any, anywhere you see E1B1, right? Anywhere you see E1B1, you usually see T. Usually, usually, because the reason why is because they started to migrate with them. So right here, you can see a quote on that. We had talked about that and talked about that right here. You can see it yourself. It's also about the lineage, right? This goes in and talks a little bit about of how the E lineage, which is actually also talked about as being Arabic, the original Arabic lineage, it talks about how it went up to the north 
And then basically in the north area, it came back with right here. You can see right here. Just talks about this test here. Just go down, talk about the Natufian. Those are the E1B1. There's an E lineage, right? We talked about that. The T, right? CT, because CT makes E and D and, and CT makes C and F. It lets us know right here, the same hablo groups show up in pre-pottery Neolithic B. That's where you find your E1B1A. Now, obviously, they call it pre-pottery Neolithic B because there's no, um, obviously, iron work. Why? Because the biblical narrative tells us that they didn't have iron and all those things. But it's also important to know that that is going to be important for um, looking in closer because the E1B1A lineage, they even say their selves, time frame is only 6,000 years to, to be to, at the farthest reach, at the farthest reach. Obviously, understanding when I say 6,000 years, understand, understand, understand. Their years are grossly, grossly, grossly over-exaggerated. Um, but you can see right here, when they came down, it says during that time, they was accompanied by new Hablo groups, H2 and 2, I mean, and T, right? So H and T came with E1B, 1B, and we can follow them throughout history. We can follow them as they move around looking at the lineages there. Um, obviously, that's something that had happened there. Also, you can see right here, you can see right here, this, they just talk about how these ones are the, the Middle Eastern one on this thing. So you can see that they're trying to give you information, but it's also important to look at the information um, more closely on these things. So that's why I always talk about that, that the E1B1B lineage, you see that? E1B1B, this is E1B1B, all the way in the North, all the way in the North in ancient times, ancient, ancient times. Ancient, ancient times, it came all the way up here. This is E1B1B. This is the original Arabic line, the original Arabic line. Um, so you can see a little bit on that. So the T lineage, why the T lineage, right? Because the movement of E1B1B lineage, right, which are closely linked to the diffusion of Afro-Asiatic languages, right? Because what is an Afro-Asiatic language? Since that's actually talk about Afro-Asiatic. That's actually your Shemitic language, right? Afro-Asiatic, what they say. Because the Egyptians were speaking that, the Canaan, original Canaanites were speaking that. Um, that was something that the Hebrews were speaking, the Afro, they call it Afro-Asiatic, which is actually uh, Shemitic language. E1B1B was actually the movement um, that brought those things forth. Even so, um, obviously, understanding these things is one of those things that we ourselves have to know um, that these things surely happen. These things are a thing that's surely uh, true and whatnot. Um, let me see. I want to show you one more piece here. I think that's good enough. All right. So just, just to let you know, E1B1B came up here in ancient times, came back down to the Levant with T. But that's why the thing that he said there is true. It's absolutely true that the E1B is actually going to be linked to your Levant. In fact, that's the only lineage you see in the Levant. This is ancient times in the Levant. Israel, 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 Israel. You always see E. You see some H. Remember I talked about that H? You found H there, right? That came down as well. But you see your E1B1, right? He talks about that in Israel, ancient times. Ancient, ancient times. See what's going on there? Ancient times. Go up a little bit. So we had talked about that. We had talked about that earlier. But let's keep on going. Um, and that's a very common argument to make. And it's not being made only with regarding Turks and the Kafkaz, we can see it with Latinos and, and, and essentially every population in Ashkenazi Jews show similarity too because they're a very heterogeneous population and there is lots of uh, uh, coming in and mixing and so on and so forth. Uh, they are expected to show similarity to other populations, but rather than interpreting the data in that way, it's consistent with historical uh, uh, data that we have, it is being interpreted as the other guy is a Jew, he just doesn't know that. And that allows uh, a genetic testing company to make a lot of money. Um, so uh, such argument was made recently by Bihar and colleagues that trace Ashkenazi Jews to Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Eastern Turkey, but instead of um, interpreting the data such as Turkish origin, which, which they should have, that was the logic of their analysis, uh, they claim that those people share um, Levantine, where it says Middle Eastern in this context, that means Levantine uh, origin with Jews, hence this is why Jews are interested. So nowhere, there, no, nowhere, no matter where Jews are gonna be predicted, it's because the other guy is, is a Jew, he just doesn't know that. And we're going back to Levant. You, you can understand it's a nonsense argument, but that's the one being made. Um, at Simon and colleagues um, also found that Northern Italians show greatest uh, uh, proximity to Ashkenazic Jews, followed by um, other Italians and, and French. 
um, which should have been interpreted as a non-Semitic Mediterranean ancestry. Instead, they, they decided Ashkenazi Jews demonstrate a Middle Eastern ancestry based on absolutely nothing. Um, the uh, same uh, authors uh, also interpreted different patterns of genetic segments uh, that are IVD, um, so uh, very long stretches of genome, very similar to other populations, uh, but they explain the data in the demographic miracle rather than explain it as scientists should without using miracles. Um, so far, as far as I know, no large scale study has reported that Ashkenazi Jews are genetically closer to Germans or Israelite populations when compared with Near Eastern and Southern European populations. Um, and um, in our analysis, all biogeographical analysis, Bedouins and Palestinians are the only populations localized to Israel, uh, not Jews. Jews are from the Caucasus and the Syrian regions as well. Um, so this paper was uh, received quite well. Uh, the number of readers in the first couple of weeks estimated in the millions. Um, this is the uh, unfortunately only third most read paper in genome biology and evolution. I, I find it quite hard to top uh, the first two that uh, one I read, one I wrote, and, and the other one is a highlight. Uh, the fifth one is has nothing to do with Ashkenazi Jews, but you're still welcome to read it. Um, and uh, and we're able to do some citizen science to to allow people to um, to uh, take part of uh, future research or or just. Um, if, if they want, or just um, use GPS to uh, study their own origins. Um, so I developed this tool for uh, DNA Diagnostic Center. It's called GPS Origins. Um, it is much more advanced than the GPS I just presented in, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, for once, it has uses a um, much larger number of gene pools. So it allows to con the signal, the ancestry signal, much better. Um, it is a very large panel of reference populations, <clears throat> so I think it's it, it's over 1,000 reference populations, and it doesn't yield a single point of origin like GPS does. It yields two, um, for sp roughly corresponding to two paternal uh, parental lines, and and each line also has some migration route, which is um, uh, how the DNA travels uh, along very uh, very. Uh, long time, of course. This is not the migration of a single person. This is how the DNA, um, where the DNA turned, as in uh, which populations it shows lesser similarity, uh, similarities. And, and the full analysis will also give you the, the, the timestamps and, and events that led to this prediction. But these results that you see on the screens are for Russian Jew. Um, and interestingly, you can see the two lines converged. In, in the region of ancient Ashkenaz and as they moved on together to Turkey. Uh, I, I, I felt it was quite a romanticized uh, result um, that, that this person got. Um, and, and to the two lines. Very interesting. So obviously he had updated his tool. Now it's also important to note, right? We already pointed out that we can find J's in the Levant, we can find R's in the Levant, we find E's, but we gotta know where we find each one of those, right? Where's the J, where's the R, where's the E? The J is going to be in Sidon, right? And a lot of times the R is gonna be in the area of the Philistines, and then the E is actually, that's the real Shemitic lineage, the E lineage. Lines converged in, in the region of ancient Ashkenaz and as they moved on together to Turkey. Uh, I, I, there were uh, we responded to the first one in very details, and 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 again the first and the second one, um, our response is summarized here. I'm not going to discuss their uh, criticism in detail. I don't think it is very interesting. None of them uh, discuss the major finding, which is the uh, primeval villages and and the link between genetics and geography, which we demonstrated. They just want to you know say that they don't agree with the results and, and they have the right to do so, but I have the right to ignore it. Uh, at least in this presentation, I, my, my deta our detailed response is, is in those papers. Um, and I'm not gonna, uh, I don't wanna waste time this reviewing it. What I would like to talk about a little bit is the second response that we provided. Um, not the response itself, but the added analysis that we did. Uh, the, the top figure shows you a, a summary of all biogeographical predictions ever made for Ashkenazi Jews. So it has the 2013, my 13 uh, paper, 
the Vihart al uh, results, and then the Dasat al results. They were all made based on different data sets of Ashkenazi Jews using three different methods, and they all you can see they all converge in Turkey. Okay. I, I'm absolutely fascinated that my 2013 very limited biographical notebooks yield the same results as, as GPS. Uh, Bihar's method is just off, um, but uh, as you can see, it is not in, in, in Israel. Um, and that, of course, did not is not what the authors reported. They just ignored their own results. Um, so, so this is a summary of, uh, of findings on, on uh, uh, biographical localization of Ashkenazi Jews. The figure below um, already was done at a time where ancient DNA data became uh, sufficient to allow further exploration um, of more ancient origins. And what you see here is a supervised admixture analysis where we ask um, for modern day populations to reach ancient populations, uh, do you most look like? Uh, so these um, uh, European hunter-gatherers and Anatolians, Levantines, and Iranians, they're all ancient populations whose DNA was uh, sequenced from skeletons and mummies. Um, of course, they're all from different times. We didn't have the luxury with these limited data to uh, uh, select it to reflect particular time. So it has it is a bit limited. But nonetheless, you can see that when all things are equal, uh, Levantine populations show very high similarity to ancient Levantines, whereas Ashkenazi Jews show similarity to ancient Iranians uh, in agreement with our results above and the uh, findings from um, of the Das et al. paper that Ashkenazi Jews are of Iranian origin. Okay, so this is completely consistent with the ancient DNA evidence. Uh, and that paper also uh, did very well in, uh, in Frontiers. Um, two popular, uh, popular science uh, articles that I wrote for the conversation um, also did very well. So there are about uh, 500 readers per day. Um, and I think in my institution, I'm ranked top 10 uh, most read author. Um, and, and here too, with, with the rise of ancient DNA um, sciences and the progress made in this field by others and, and, and of course our group, we also wanted to allow some... Now this might be something interesting, um, but that price is way too much for me. But that's really interesting that he has a DNA test that tests for ancient Israelites. And, and what is the ancient Israelite genetics? He says E1B1, that's what he says. So he, he actually has a test that actually is available that he can actually test for ancient Israelites. That would be really interesting for someone to do that, to see what actually is the ancient Israelites, who are the ancient Israelites and, and what genetics are they. Um, obviously when it comes to these things, I don't think, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, if someone wants to know who they are, you know, as always good, you know, to know who you are. Uh, Messiah is our first thing, first and foremost thing. But you know, if someone wants to know a little bit of these things, it's always good. That's fine. That's really interesting. You know how he got that? I'm a, maybe you know just to look and see what did he put as ancient genetics on there? Like what what did he put as ancient Israel? That's really interesting. What would you think he put? Would he put a T? Would he put E1B1? Uh, very interesting. So I, that's one of those things that uh, probably look more into in a free time, but. That's another subject for another day. Citizen science allow people to experience with the data and experiment with it. A different company called DNA Consultants um, uh, uh, agreed to develop uh, the, the, uh, to, to, to make available the primeval DNA test that I developed. Um, so um, interestingly, we have ancient Israelites in the, as one of the populations that, uh, that people can test with. Um, so this is one uh, example of, of results. There, there, there are other screens I'm not showing here of a person who took the test, and that's the genetic similarity that they have with um, all these different skeletons that, uh, you know, we, we, we give them names to uh, make it more fun, and every skeleton has, has their own story. Um, and you can see that the eye similarities with ancient DNA, that, uh, an ancient person that we call uh, Gal, um, and um, 
uh, I, I believe she's a uh, Neolithic female. Um, yes. Um, so, um, so to summarize, um, our study aimed to answer major questions regarding the term Ashkenaz, the original of Ashkenaz Jews, and Yiddish, um, in light of two uh, prevailing hypotheses, the Rhineland hypothesis, the random social Slavic hypothesis, um, our findings um, supported uh, the Irano social Slavic hypothesis. We found no evidence whatsoever for 11 time origin um, letter analysis that we used ancient DNA, um, sustained those findings. Um, in fact, uh, there is no evidence for 11 time origin in the literature. All we have are results being interpreted or again, misinterpreted in favor of Middle Eastern origin, or most likely um, the, the, the Near Eastern origins in these Caucasus and Turkey represented as uh, are being misinterpreted as being a midway between the Levant and, and Europe. Um, again, there is no evidence for this. This is just wishful thinking um, and, and a lot of bad science. I'm certainly not going to read the whole thing. It's all summarized in the paper below, uh, but uh, those results. Um, produce um, a new history for Ashkenazi Jews where the origin of the people was from uh, God-fearers communities that resided in the Black Sea. At some point, the, um, they fully converted to Judaism. The only difference between God-fearers and a Jew is the circumcision. Um, they probably um, had one rabbi too many coming from Iran and, and beginning this process, which, which, which took a very long time. Uh, to, to be established, but uh, uh, making circumcision more pre prevalent than it used to be. Uh, there was a reason why they opposed uh, circumcision, uh, more than one, but that's a story for a different time. Um, and, and, and after that, they moved on um, um, following um, uh, unpleasant events they experienced in Turkey. Uh, so there was, of course, the uh, the uh, Muslim invasion, and, and there was some climate change and, and other geopolitical changes that made Turkey uh, uh, um, not any, not desirable anymore. And they moved in two possible directions, one the north the northern uh, uh, direction to the Khazarian Empire and the westward direction towards Italy. Um, So obviously, you know, he's talking about uh, circumcision. Now, if you never heard, if you never knew about this, uh, let me see how how this is worded. Uh, all right, I'm gonna just show you something real fast if I can find it. Um, or what people are more circumcised? I gotta think about uh, because sometimes you gotta you gotta you gotta phrase it right. You got all this this stuff. Let me show you something real fast. Let me see. I might even say what nation. Uh, let me actually, let me go Google, because Google might make it a little easier to find. <laughs> you hear the munchkins and everything, but you can see we're, we're at the end now um, on these things. I just want to show you something real fast. Um, so here's like a, a quick answer for right here. The reason why, because I want to get you a, a straight medical report, a real medical report on these things. Um, okay, so right here, the practice is more common. So circumcision, who, what, what places are more circumcised? The practice is more common in some areas of the world than others, right? According to the World Health Organization, right? According to who? Circumcision is most common in North Africa, West Africa, and mid the Middle East. Now that's really interesting because you're probably wondering, 
you know, why would Africans circumcise themselves? Why would why would the Africans do that, right? And I, I thought they were um I, I thought Africa was full of Hamites, right? I thought Africa was full of Hamites. And yeah, it's not. Africa is not full of Hamites. Africa is actually full of different types of peoples. And that's that's where the world comes into play into working on the truth and bringing truth to life because the world that we live in today is full of deceit and lies. Let me show you something real fast. Let me show you something real fast. And I'm gonna show you that they know for a fact that the E1, B1, um, M2 lineage, that's the lineage of the Israelites. And it actually shows that they actually used to be in the Middle East. It actually shows that they used to be in the Middle East. So notice that the practices are found in the lower areas. Hold on, one second. All right. Let me show you something real fast. Let me show you something that Family Tree DNA says. All right. So I showed this once before, but I'm going to show it now. Let me see real fast. Hold on. I'm going to show you something real fast. Let me just go to that. Let me just make sure it's not at the bottom. Just looking here. No, it's not at the bottom. All right. Let me go up to it then. Let me show you what Family Tree DNA said. Um, you probably would never, I never seen a quote like this online. That's why sometimes I send direct questions to Family Tree DNA. And I should show you this quote that I sent to Family Tree DNA that they didn't even want to answer it. They just completely uh, jumped the gun and didn't want to answer it. Even though I said, because if you ask about E1B1A, you know what they're going to try to do? They're going to revert you back to the basal population. Who's the basal population of E1B1A? E1B1B. E1B1A is, is what they, they're trying to take you away from E1B1A and lead you to the basal population of E1B1B. But watch what it says here. E-M2 is common throughout sub-Saharan Africa, right? And also in the Near East. Now, it's probably important to know what I asked. Um, let me show you what I asked here. So this is what I said. I'm going to show you the whole question to show you what I said to them. Because I wanted to let them know, you know, I knew a little bit about these things and whatnot. And I wanted them to give me a straight answer. I'm just going show you what I asked and I'm going to show you the answer here. All right. So remember, remember, this is what this is a real information I'm showing you here. Who's who's more circumcised and why? All right. Let me show you something. All right. Let me read the question first. This is what I sent on a request form. I said, the e Hablo groups found in Israel, if I'm in, if I'm of M2 E1B1A, E1B1A Hablo group, would that mean that I'm Middle Eastern, right? Then I showed them the obviously the thing that said about E1B1, E1B1B, right? Because this is actually X excluding E1B1A. This is actually E1B1B. That means that these are actually going to be related to E1B1A. Now watch what it says here. As now, obviously, I know that E1B1A, I have a quote now. This is um, earlier on. You see, this is like a couple months back. I obviously have a quote of E1B1A in the land of the Levant. But it's watch what it says. As there are no older finds of e Hablo groups, right? Because I knew that they were family. e Hablo groups I found outside of the Levant. Because the e Hablo group, E1B1A, is not found in ancient lower Africa. Is not found in ancient lower Africa. It's clear that there was a migration, a massive migration of E1B1A. As there is no older finds of E Hablo groups I found outside the Levant, right? So again, seeing Hablo group E and its root CT, which break into CF, is found in the Middle East in fossils, right? If I'm of E Hablo groups, I would be linked to the ancient lands of the Middle East, correct? Let's see what he said there. He says this. Hello, Demetrius. So it's going to be from Robert R., uh, Info information specialist at Family Tree DNA. He says E-M2 is common throughout sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Near East. So where was the people most circumcised? North Africa, West Africa, in the Middle East? Okay. Uh, now watch what he says here. Also in the Near East. So it could represent a back migration from the Near 
Is period. M2 shows a back migration from the Near East going down into Africa. That's very important to understand because they were called out of Egypt. They went into the Levant and then they were exiled into Africa throughout many different parts of time. But he tried to point me to the basal population, which he thinks I'm mentally uh, disabled understanding genetics and points me to E1B1B. I should show you, I should show you this other one. I want to show you this other one. Maybe I could show you. I'm not worry about this stuff about the it's about the change in a minute. It's all about the change in a minute. But let me go to my email and let me show you what I got. Let me show you this email I got. All right. Let me just go to this one of family tree DNA. Just go down a little bit. Yes, you get to see all my emails and everything. But let me show you something. I was real upset from this because they just completely uh, disregarded my question. So I asked a, a decent question, but let me read the question to you. Here's what I asked. I have a question directly about E1B1A, M2, place of origin, as I seek a right of return, right? Don't we deserve a right of return if we M2? It says, we note. M35, now this is just some extra information. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. If you want to, this is what I'm gonna read right here. Pretty much long story short, um, I'm just gonna summarize it. I just, right here, I just described that um, E1B1B, I just give them the information how I know E1B1B is who is linked to and whatnot. And it says, also I'll be talking ancient fossils as it makes no sense to declare someone's place of origin by modern people, locations, right? as the world had many migrations and perhaps the place of start may be different than originally suggested based on the idea on the idea of pigmentation made evolution yet we know hablo groups can be any level of melanin right seeing ct makes cf and de it's like trying to figure out a culture a culture's ancient beliefs based on modern ethics, ethnicity, right? That's not how you find out someone's ancient beliefs on what they do now, right? After mass colonization, as genetics should be done unbiasedly, right? It should not have a racist um, bias to it, but there's a lot of racist bias to it already, right? When I say racist bias, because a lot of times with the Ashkenazi um, doctrine, that's why genetics is here because they're studying it to try to even just find who is Israel. A lot of times that's actually what the depth of genetics is. Now the older B1, E1B1B is found in ancient fossils in the Middle East Natufians, especially in ancient Saudi Arabia, even all the Red Sea till the Gulf of Aden, of, uh, or Aden and Persian Gulf, right? Now we know they have a lot of hot spots in Natufian times from Arabia to what is now called Africa, which migration is historically recorded by the first century historian. So I just give them that quote from the first century historian of the migration of the sons of Keturah all the way to what this what is called Africa, right? Even the even the mixing of Hercules, so-called Hercules of the Greeks, because he gave his daughter, and we can find the L3 lineage in the area of the Europe. We can find L3 because the, the Greeks were mixing with them. Um, I had sent one of those uh, information to one of the brothers when I was talking about L3 in ancient um, um, Ireland. You can look it up, L3 in ancient Ireland. Um, so it just talks about them mixing, giving their daughters and everything and whatnot. And obviously the most important piece is that the ones in Arabia, right? It talks about the ones in Arabia. They actually moved to the place of Africa when they took it, when they took Libya, right? We already see where that's right here. It says, it is told about that this Orphrine that he had made war against Libya, right? And took it, because I know that geneticists don't like to look up history, and took it, and that his grandchildren, when they inhabited it, called it from his name, Africa. This is what I sent him. Sent her or him or whoever it is. It says, so excluding, now watch what I say here. Watch what I say here, and I'm gonna show you that they, they didn't wanna answer the question. So excluding, excluding true original ancient Shemitic Arabian E1B1B, right? I'm excluding that, right? I'm excluding the ancient E1B1B, right? Which is Shemitic because that's also so-called, they know that that's supposedly found in Ashkenaz, they say just Shemitic, right? But we know it's actually really Shemitic because it actually is Arabic. 
if I'm E1B1A, is my homeland Israel as it's said? This look how many times I asked this question. I asked it once at the start. Right? Doesn't a teacher tell you to ask, you know, when you make a sentence or a paragraph to phrase the thing once at, at the start, then at the end, right? But I put it at the middle too. So right there, I asked the question excluding E1B1B. I asked the question again, excluding E1B1B, right? Well, right here, excluding E1B1B, right? So excluding E1B1B, right? If I'm E1B1A, and is Israel my homeland? As I said, based on anthropo I don't know if I'm saying that part, that part right. Anthropological, or how you say that, evidence. It is suggested, right? Basically, the study of ancient um, DNA of the fossils. It is suggested that the Natufians and their descendants, and their descendants. What does that mean? Because E1B1, E1B1 makes E1B and E1B1A, and the Natufian has E1B1. So. It is suggested that the Natufians and their descendants formed a core population that can be traced to recent times, but was mixed with incoming groups. That was mentioned early on in 1973. Here's the source. I just give them the source and everything. And then watch this. Therefore, again, here's the last question. Watch what I say here. Therefore, again, excluding basal, excluding basal E1B1B, my sons of E1B1A and my daughters of L3, ancient homeland is Israel. You see what I just asked there? Is, is the ancient homeland of E1B1A Israel? Didn't I just confirm with another geneticist? Remember how I showed you with another geneticist, how he says EM2 is common throughout sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Near East. So it could represent a back migration from the Near East. This is from Robert right there, right? And yet he wanted to he wanted to say alter alter and bring forth the basil. So I wanted to ask a question and say excluding the basil, right? Because I want you to get a full answer without the add-on of the basal population of E1B1B. Let's look, let's look at what they said here. Here's someone, this person, whoever this is, I'm so angry with you because you know about the big Y test. You're a big Y specialist and you should know what I'm asking there. All right. So let's read it. Hello, Demetrius. Thank you for contacting Family Tree DNA. From the best I can tell, what is he talking about now? I didn't ask about E1B1B. From the best I can tell, E-M2215, which is E1B1B. From the best I can tell, E1B1B originated from the area around what is now, what is now Egypt. That's what the other person tried to pull out when you talk about, oh, the, the other basal, alter, alter, alternatively, that same basal population that led to the Natufian could have also remained in Africa. Yes, sure, that basal population, but what about E1B1A directly? You see what I'm saying here? I can tell E-M215 e originated in the around area, what is now Egypt. Although it looks like from, from there, some men with E-M215 did end up in Israel. Okay, we understand that. We know that E1B1B is in Israel. He says the best way to determine your refined Y DNA, he just wants us, this person obviously being a Y, a big Y DNA specialist, they want us to take the big Y test. But that's obviously not what I'm asking. I'm not asking about e m did that question, did you see in that question me as, didn't I say excluding? Then how many times did I say it? So excluding the true original ancient Shemitic Arabian E1B1B. If I'm E1B1A, is my homeland Israel? Again, therefore again, excluding E1B1B. My Is it my son's, is this, is my homeland Israel? Excluding, excluding it. As, as I said at the start, it says, I have a question directly about E1B1A, M2, place of origin, as I seek a right of return, right? And then I just let them know that I'm excluding this part when, I, when I'm breaking this down. Now the odor such and such is found such and such, and I, I let them know that I'm excluding it, right? Right here, also as known as such and such. So I'll be talking directly of M2 right here when I say excluding it, when I'm excluding this one, right? Let them know, right? So excluding excluding true original ancient Shemitic Arabian E1B1B. If I'm E1B1A, is my homeland Israel? 
as I said, right? One more time, there again, excluding basil, E1, B1, B, right? Excluding it as that's why I found the problem was that they wanted to throw that alternative of that basal population of E1B1B. E1, B. Why can't they why can't they just give a straight answer on E1B1A? E1, Already got an answer. M2 is common throughout sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Near East. So it could represent a back migration from the Near East. No wonder that they find out that a lot of the Africans were actually Israelites. It's important to understand that the E lineage is actually going to be Israel. And you wonder why the zeal eats me up. It says the practice is more common in some areas of the world than others. According to the World Health Organization, circumcision is most common in North Africa, West Africa, which we actually get the mention of West Africa from the historians, where they tell you in West Guinea. And the area of Guinea was where they was actually the Jews were, right? The Jews were in West Guinea, North Africa, West Africa, and the Middle East. So we already got the answer that E lineage was actually in the Middle East. Yet, you're going to always have individuals that even though you ask a direct question, they're going to work their way around it like they don't have a clue what you're talking about. Like they have no clue at all. Either they didn't, either this person didn't read the question or they just, that's just how they're going to get down with the truth. So I just want you to know that, that I just showed you that the information that I show, I'm showing you is valid and many people are suffering the consequences of having truth. So I just want to show you that. Put that there. And you wonder why this stuff eats me up, but this stuff is going to constantly eat me up and I'm going to constantly bring this stuff out. Uh, so that's, uh, these are the conclusions of, of my study. You're very welcome to read uh, more of um, our academic work in my website. There are a lot of other popular science articles. Uh, this is my YouTube channel. Um, I'm also available on Twitter and my blog. Uh, thank you for watching. All right, so with that family, everything that I showed you today, I'm just letting you know that just like the the scientists or you know geneticists who basically is bringing this stuff out, he's gonna he's gonna suffer persecution to the to his all finish. He's gonna suffer it until it's, it's finished. But we're gonna keep on bringing out this information, even if there's brothers who you know get in their feelings and say, "Oh, why are you looking into those things? You're just like the rest of the Hebrew Israelites." But we're not. The truth is we know that anyone can be saved by grace, right? It's through grace through faith. But it's important to understand truth is truth. Identity death is identity death. You understand? So I just want you to understand that, that what we just went over today is that there's a clear identity death going on in the world today. So with that family, may they return what is supposed to be returned to the proper people as Yah is at hand to do the work that he's going to do with a recompense. So with that, be loved, be beloved, and continue on with your Messiah and continue on the truth and the way. With that, keep on waiting because time is at hand. Be blessed, be beloved, and amen.